Hello, welcome to the first ever, the inaugural Sonic Sorcery podcast, and I'm joined by my good friend Tom Quayle, who is a fusion guitar player, amongst many other things, including Incredible Human Being, out of Leeds, UK. So Tom, thank you for being with me today. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, it's a pleasure. I've been a big fan of yours for a while now. Which is just uh, completely mind-boggling. I don't really understand that. The, the circumstances into which we met were actually pretty funny as well. I, I'll link a clip down in the description of that moment because it is recorded. I had been watching you on YouTube since, you know, whatever, like when you started probably when I was like a teenager or something playing guitar. I thought like, this is the dude, unbelievable player. And then one day you just showed up on my stream as I was composing some music and I was flab flabbergasted, literally flabbergasted. I don't think I've ever experienced that in my life prior to that moment. So that was quite something. <laughs> I, I do remember that moment quite well. I'd actually been watching you for a while because the YouTube algorithm had done a good thing for once. And I don't remember the circumstances, but uh, you're, you came up on my feed and I clicked on a live stream you were doing. And I was amazed immediately because uh, we talked about this the other day when we had a chat the other day, obviously, just to kind of, you know, leisurely chat rather than a podcast. Um, and I was saying to you that the level of musicianship combined with that level of production and compositional skills uh, in a live stream was something I'd never come across before. I think as well, you happened to be composing some kind of sort of fusion funk kind of thing at the time. So immediately I was hooked. Because it was the, the harmony was all there, which was super cool for me. So yeah, it was a really good experience. I think I watched two or three more, and then I commented because I just felt sometimes a lot of people will lurk on those kind of streams, and I was like, I've got to say something about how good this is. <laughs> if you if you appreciate something, you should you should say you know, especially on a live stream, this is great, and it was absolutely fantastic. So wow. congratulations on the skill set that you've developed. It's amazing. Hey, likewise. Thank you so much. I don't know what to say about that. Honestly, it's. Probably like you, it, it all has just come from the joy of playing music and learning and studying and thinking and creating and whatever, you know, it's just got to do it. I can't do anything else, really. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's awesome to have you here for the for the first one of these. I've never done a podcast before for anybody that is out there watching this for the first time. And I'm stoked on it. I've always wanted to chat with other musicians, composers, whoever about the craft, about the philosophy of it, about everything, you know, and I'm I'm very excited that we can do it together. And I want to start with just like a really super simple question right off the gate. <clears throat> the question is this, what is music, Tom? Wow, super simple. <laughs> um, what is music? Pretend um, I don't know. Pretend I've never heard of music before. I have no clue of what it is. Uh by the, before I answer the question, if you hear like lots of scampering feet, that's my dog in the dogs in the background. Um, yeah, my dog's here too. <laughs> uh, what is music? Um, a completely unique and addictive experience that I can't liken to anything else in the world. There's nothing else that gives the same feeling as music does. It doesn't matter, you know, there's all sorts of things that give human beings amazing experiences and pleasure, but music is totally unique. Nothing else can make me feel the way that music does. That particular series of frequencies happening at that particular time kind of blows me away. I remember years ago listening to a Leonard Bernstein lecture where he's talking about harmonic series. And it just so happens that in nature, this harmonic series exists, which I find quite bizarre anyway and that human beings have been able to manipulate it um, to create, well, the bias I have of Western harmony, let's go there to start with, because I don't have a lot of experience elsewhere, that you can take harmony like that and rhythm and combine those two in an infinite number of different ways and create an experience in human brains that then propagates itself through the human body, which is just totally unachievable in any other way. I know. It's incredible. It's it's really remarkable and strange at the same time when you think about it. Really strange. <laughs> exactly. It's really, really strange. It's really, really weird. We get so accustomed to it thinking like, yeah, it's just music. It's just a guitar. It's just a piano. It's just the drums, you know. But if you like mm -hmm. let go of all that and just actually experience what it is, it's like, what is this? You know, it's mm. completely invisible. It's utterly intangible. It just 
it 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 refreshes itself endlessly. You can't hold on to anything. Any sound is just gone, 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 gone. And yet it's so coherent and so uh, emotionally resonant. And it, it's like you say, it's impossible to describe. So the the question is impossible to answer. But I, yeah. I'm gr- glad you went down that path with it because that's my experience of it too. It's it's something that is for me as well, utterly addictive and essential to my life, essential. Mm. I, I mean, obviously music is a universal thing for human beings, but I, again, this is a real big bias on my part because I've never not, I, I don't remember a time in my life where I didn't have music as my main sort of, you know, I wake up in the morning and the first thing I think about is music. What am I going to play today? Or, And that, that possibly has waned a little bit as I've got older and it's been my job. But still, it's probably one of the first things I think about during the day. I walk in this room and it is just surrounded by musical equipment to make music with or, you know, to to have a musical experience. But it's a very universal thing. My daughter, she's six and, you know, she absolutely adores listening to music. And, you know, she's not, I've not taught her that experience. I know a lot of parents can be quite pushy with that stuff and they, I'm a musician, I'm going to make my child a musician. But she just absolutely loves it. But... I do know people, and this is totally fine, but I know people who just don't have music in their lives. They listen to music in a kind of incidental way. So they'll put back in the day the radio on, or they'll put Alexa on or Spotify or something on just to play music in the background. But it doesn't have any um, functional meaning beyond just filling a void, filling some space in the background. And that to me is, again, with my particular bias being a musician, I find that very sad, you know. Um, that someone doesn't have that connection in their life with this incredible uh, experience of music. You know, they, again, like I say, there's nothing else that I can think of that makes me feel the way that music does. To, to give you an example, and this is an example that any guitar players in the room will be able to relate to. The very first time I ever heard Under a Glass Moon by Dream Theater, such a guitaristic thing to say, but the very <laughs> first time I heard that, that was possibly the first time I'd heard some of those harmonies being presented in a kind of rock slash slightly metal context. And the experience I've had, I can still slightly recall what that felt like physically at that time. Just the, the physicality of that experience of listening to that music for the first time. Uh, I wish I could get that experience back actually, because it's so amazing. And that feeling is addictive as well, of listening to music you know, for the first, experiencing music for the first time. Um, I'm having some of that at the moment because I've got a bit more into electronic music, which I've no, actually, this is partly your fault. Um, but, you know, been playing guitar and being into jazz and fusion for such a long time now. And I, we talked about this the other night. I bought some synths recently and I've been getting into electronic music, listening to Mafex Twin and Square Pusher and uh, some slightly more eclectic stuff as well. Um, and just that experience again of listening to uh, music that I never heard before, excuse my coffee machines turning off in the background. Um, Nothing else can, can match that experience that that new music gives you. It's just incredible. I know. I'm I'm going on on about it now, but no, no, it's just, I I completely resonate with that. And I actually have a similar experience very early. must've been, you know, early memory forming times anyway, seven years old, eight years old, something like this. And I heard, I heard, the solo to Billie Jean. Mm. Uh, Billie Jean, is that the one? With uh, Eddie Van Halen? Am I thinking of the right oh, song? Um, no, no, no. Beat it, uh, beat it. Beat it, yeah, yeah, beat it. I, I heard that with like the little tapping bits and the stuff that, that goes on in there. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is that? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. and my parents told me, oh, it's a guitar. I was like, what? And it was years till I started playing guitar. Later I was 13 and, I, and again, it was Eddie Van Halen at the time for whatever reason heard eruption and I heard the whole tapping thing again. I was like, I don't even know how to make sense of this sound that I'm hearing right now. I'd already been at playing piano and things at the time, but that again was one of these completely novel experiences at that time that was, I couldn't even think as it was happening, which is essentially what it is, right? That's, that's the feeling yeah. that we're talking about. When And I, I have a practice that I engage in and recommend to my students, I call baby listening, which has to, at our 
point in time has to be cultivated. It's not, you know, we're far past being able to just simply access that immediately, but you can probably understand what I mean by the term. Yeah. And yeah. and that was one of those times where I had I'd already had labels for it. Oh, it's a piano, oh, this is drums, oh, it's even a guitar. But I heard that and I thought like, I was stunned, just stunned, as probably so many are. And the same experience coming to electronic music later in life I had heard some electronic music growing up, of course, and even listened to some as a teenager. But it wasn't until I, I heard like around 2009, 10, some dubstep that was happening at the time when dubstep was really getting into this, you know, as we refer to a bro step phase, you know, all this stuff that goes yeah, I know on. exactly what you mean. Yeah. I heard yeah. that and I was like, what is that? Yeah. You know, it just blew me away. <laughs> It's, it's happened to me with so many different things. I mean, I can think of very specific points in my life where I heard a particular piece of music or a particular player. So, I mean, Pat Metheny was an amazing example, but in, in completely non-guitaristic areas as well. The first time I ever heard, um, are you a Ravel fan? Yeah. <laughs> right. There's a, um, a concerto in G major for the left hand. And the first movement is very pretty, very... Oh, sorry, the first movement is, is really chaotic and, and strange, typical sort of Ravel. And the second movement, it starts out incredibly pretty and beautiful. And this was the first Ravel I'd ever heard. My guitar teacher at the time, very thankful for him because he played me a very eclectic range of music. And this Ravel piece was one of these um, pieces of music. And you've got to bear in mind, at this point, I hadn't really started playing jazz. I'd never heard what you would term as outside playing before. And there's always these things in music where you, there's a thing you've never heard before and suddenly you're addicted again and you're going down a rabbit hole. Um, and this second movement has really beautiful harmony with really incredible arranging, uh, really fantastic orchestration. And then suddenly the melody out of the blue is so outside harmonically. And I remember listening to it and being caught completely off guard because he hadn't said to me, you know, this is gonna happen. So I was just hearing this beautiful music. And I remember that this, this switch going off in my head where I thought, this sound, now I'm addicted to this. I need to hear more of this. I have to hear more. What? And I, said, I remember saying to him, what else is like this? I need more of this. How do I, give me a list of stuff. This is where I am with electronic music now. I have a couple of friends who are very into it and they've just given me a list of stuff to listen to. And that feeling of just consuming that stuff. I mean, it's not as, um, it's not quite as tangible these days because I know I sound like a boomer now, but you would, consume it on a CD and you would get the liner notes out and you would, you know, go through the whole thing and it was an experience and a journey. In a way now it's it's a bit different. I'll go on a walk with the dogs and I'll I'll go on uh, Spotify or whatever and create a playlist for myself of all the things that people have recommended. And that experience is quite, it's still amazing. It's a remarkable experience. But there's so many of those tangible moments where I discover something new or someone has shown me something new and that's it. I'm off down a rabbit hole. And again, for me, Apart from possibly video games, nothing else comes close to <laughs> giving me that experience. And only a certain type of video game will give me that experience. Where the, with music for me, it's a lot wider uh, experience. I can listen to a lot of music and get really, really amazing experiences. So yes, nothing else comes close to me, you know. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand video games as well. And it, it just reminds me, you've mentioned it now, the word a few times, harmony. And at some point I want to get into some conversation about, you know, the relationship if both experientially and as a player for you between harmony and melody. Um, but harmony, you know, if I had desert island aspect of music, you got to live with its harmony. I can't, you know, I can't avoid it. It's just for me, it's the bee's knees. And there was a, a time similar to this um, Ravel thing you're talking about where I heard when I was 15, 16, I heard um, Take Six sing The Star Spangled mm. Banner. Mm -hmm. And they start off all in unison, singing in unison, and then it just, you know, it opens up into some major triads a little bit, and then it just whoosh, into this jazz world. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? I feel like I've heard a couple of moments of this in my life, and I was chasing it. I was like, what is that sound? What is that sound? That, that dense, what we say, dense harmony. And that was like exemplifying it to a degree I'd never heard before. And my life changed immediately at that moment. I said... I have to learn how to do this. This yep. is the sound that is like defining who I am right now. And I need it, you know, and it, it was a quest. It was a, a many year quest that's ongoing now to, to find all of the ways you can manipulate harmony and voice lead and all the functional stuff and whatever, you know, I was obsessed with that, man. It was exactly the same with me. Um, 
again, when I started my jazz degree, I was interested hugely in harmony before when I started my jazz degree. I remember, uh, again, very specific turning point in my playing where and in my listening, where I, I tried to play, I was just going through the real book and I got to the end of the real book and there was this song, Very Early, by Bill Evans. Mm -hmm. And this is a song that I've been fascinated by for a couple of decades now, a jazz standard. And it isn't by the standards of, of you know, the harmony that I'm into these days, um, or the way harmony has gone, if you look at a Jacob Collier, for example, it's not that complicated, but I remember, it is fairly complicated and it's a very difficult thing to improvise over. It's a, it, you know, that, that's where some of the addiction came for me. I, so, some of the addiction with music for me is a little bit of puzzle solving. It's a little bit like the most addictive Sudoku puzzle ever, you know, trying to figure out how to reharmonize something or why does this particular harmony work or how can I thread a coherent voice-led line through this harmony? But the other side of it is just, I remember the first time, for example, I ever heard Kenny Wheeler. You know Kenny mm. Wheeler? Mm -hmm. Just, there's a song called Everybody's Song But My Own with Norma Winston singing vocals and it's a, it's a waltz and the harmony like it was one of my first experiences with proper slash chord harmony mm -hmm. and just being utterly blown away. And again, the same thing. There's that feeling. You hear it for the first time. And I, I would frequently at that period in my life have the chord chart in front of me at the same time. So my listening was being informed by the, the visual nature of the chord chart as well because I was addicted to kind of being trying to play through this stuff at the same time. And very few things in my life have ever matched those kind of experiences where you just hear some harmony for the first time. Interestingly, with with electronic music, it's actually the rhythmic side of it and the the the, the, the tone, the timbre side of it, mm -hmm. like hearing the sounds that people have shaped. Because there's something interesting about electronic music in terms of you can literally craft your own sounds using oscillators and filters and you know so on and so forth. Like watching you shape sounds on Serum, for example. There's a whole skill set with that. But as far as harmony goes, that was the thing, same as you, that just pulled me in and that was it. It was like a black hole that just grabbed me and I was <laughs> never getting out of that black hole, basically. But a good black hole. You yeah, know, yeah. It was, it no, was so yeah. Thank amazing. God. Uh, yeah. yeah, I totally resonate with that. And funny you mentioned, too, uh, the puzzle thing. For me, that's a huge aspect of composing music is it's a, it's a whole being experience. It's using full artistic sensibilities with full intellectual sensibilities and puzzle solving and everything. You know, there's there's this sensation that you get sometimes that it's a hint of a hint of a hint of an idea arises, a kind of perfume like, oh, this might be possible. And then there's the exploration of like, can I make this work? Is it possible to have a descending bass with inner lines that move up and it actually outlines the changes and the melody works with it at the same time and it's going to key change to that thing and it's going to work, you know? this I have a super, probably like yourself, a hyper-intellectual side of me and a hyper-artistic side of me too that just loves to bask in beauty, basically. And mm -hmm. the threading of those two at the same time is the most addictive and satisfying experience, which is essentially why I do music, why I compose. And and this is maybe an interesting point here is I don't have basically any interest in performing and practicing pieces and, and getting to a high level. I have done it at, at points in my life, but it never calls to me to do. There's something about the, the being by myself now it's on stream these days, but, you know, generally speaking, being by myself, quiet, testing possibilities, listening, yes, mm. no, moving, trying, revising, you know, something about this. We talked the other day about video games, and we both mentioned that what we love most about it is this exploration, the sense of exploration, what's around the corner, awe-inspiring, vistas, looking, finding, secrets, all this kind of thing. This is like composing music for me. It's like exploring the potential of the universe, essentially, and of my own nature. Like, mm -hmm. what are the sounds that I like? You come across a sound and it's just, wow. That feeling yeah. that comes then, right? You know, that's the thing. That's it for me. It's it's really interesting having watched you. It's not, it's not that common that you can see someone's process laid out as barely as yours is, you know, because you, I don't know if your composition process is different when you're on your own in the room doing it, but I'm, I would guess maybe it's not that different because you do kind of, it's not like you're putting a facade on for an audience. This is what's interesting about what you do. It's very real. It's very in the moment. You, One of the fascinating things about watching you doing what you do is you talked about 
um, the puzzle solving bit of it, I mentioned it as well. It's fascinating to watch you have two disparate sections and then go through that puzzle solving element of the transition to those, with those sections to make it work. And the different methods and solutions that you come up with, and sometimes it doesn't go right the first time, but you don't give up. There's a sense of wonder and awe in terms of, it's, it's not like you go, oh, this is too difficult. You actually maintain that almost childlike wonder of, okay, well, there has to be a solution here. What, how can I find this solution? And it's not frustrating. I, I'm guessing it's not, it doesn't seem frustrating when we're watching you do it. Um, and it's kind of interesting for me because I'm not naturally a composer. And I don't know if naturally is a good word there because, you know, that suggests that there's someone is just natural at something. They haven't put an extraordinary amount of work in. In your case, you've put an extraordinary amount of work in, I'm sure. But what I mean is I don't have an aptitude to kind of, that, that sense of wonder is more based in improvisation for me. So when you were saying about performing, you don't have really a big desire to perform um, in front of an audience and perfect pieces. I don't either, as far as um, standing in front of an audience and playing something that's set, you know, working on a piece and having it as perfect as possible. In fact, the, the, the times when I play in front of an audience, um, you know, I play live, do clinics, do masterclasses, which is a big part of what I do. The bits that make me the most nervous, I don't really get nervous for shows, but the bits that do make me nervous are the bits that are fixed, <laughs> where I have to play a melody and I have to play it perfectly, or I have to play particularly difficult phrases and they're fixed and they're always the same. And, you know, those moments make me tense. And then as soon as I start to improvise, the world just shuts down and I'm in my zone. And I absolutely adore being in front of an audience <laughs> improvising. There's nothing quite like it, you know. And I guess for me, I know, I know this is a bit of a cliche, people say this all the time, but it's like what you feel in terms of the puzzle solving of composition and the, the wonder and awe of composition, I guess is where I feel that, I feel that sense in terms of improvisation and being able to thread coherent lines through complex harmony or simple harmony that the audience feels something from what you're playing. Um, and the sense of also for me being able to maintain my level of technique as well, be able to thread technically, the, the, you know, the not have the facility to be able to play technical lines through harmony as well, to be able to hear those lines and have musicality, you know, w without being compromised by chord changes or by harmony is super addictive to me. Uh, and it's funny, actually, I, when I, when I listen to you compose, I would trade my improvisation ability for your composition <laughs> ability in a, in a heartbeat. And I guess it's always going to be that way. I guess you would always want the thing that you can't do exactly um, i mean that of course i feel the same way C coming up as a teenager watching you play i just thought like uh, there was a time in my life when when guitar was life basically that's all i wanted to do and i was going to go to music school to study it and all this it was a big big thing things happened and it just whatever happened that that i turned away from that in some aspect but there's this fantasy that I have that I get when I watch people like you. Anybody that can improvise over this kind of stuff, the stuff that I write, <laughs> I want to be able to improvise over in, a, in the exact same way, in a coherent way that threads through, but is also melodic. And, you know, this is one of the goals of mine this year is to work on this kind of thing as if, you know, I understand this is a lifetime pursuit, you know, and it's not like I'm starting from scratch. I, no, I can no, no. do something, right? But, but there's a limit and I'm sure you know, you've gone through many stages and aha moments and, you know, all this threads through to the point where we had a discussion on our discussion last time where you talked about being played, say, random chords. And then, you know, a random chord comes and you go and you go. So something that after we talked about, it, I've been doing this every day now, just, you know, really, okay. yeah, like not, not in the sense of, um, I haven't sat down and recorded like a random progression or whatever. I'm just using songs that randomly play, but I'm thinking yeah. nothing of what it is. I don't want to figure out the key, nothing like this, right? And and in particular, I'm even just as simple as, which is probably something you did long ago, simple as moving by step constantly, half step and whole step. And as chords change, moving by half step and whole step, because you can always hear, you know, the next one orally, but yep. sometimes, it, even for myself, after all these years of playing, I get confused. Is that a half step or a whole step I'm hearing? Especially when the thing 
changes mode or changes key or changes whatever, there's, there becomes this ambiguity. And I find just that practice alone, walking like scalar motion up and down through changes has been really interesting and beneficial for me. Well, just like your, I mean, your, your intuition for, let's say we take the example that I was mentioning before, where you've got two disparate sections. They're, they're, they're only disparate compositionally in terms of, obviously they will be the same tempo. Maybe the feel is different. Um, they are capable of being connected, but it takes some skill and intuition and a lot of kind of dedication to the cause to get them to connect in a coherent way that makes sense for you and the, the listener. The same thing goes for improvisation. You know, you need the intuition, but it has to be immediate. And that whole thing of if there's any sense of um, caution involved with like, oh, I'm not sure, <laughs> the moment has passed you by, especially if chord changes are flying by, which in this case, if, you know, we're talking about threading coherent ideas through chord changes where you, you know, you're talking about going by step or half step, sorry, yeah, step or half step, there cannot be any... Um, hesitation there it has to be immediate just like having a conversation um, although we have the luxury with this conversation of taking our time to consider ideas depending what the tempo is if you're playing over something really crazy you don't have that luxury of consideration you just have to go with intuition but um, that process to me became incredibly addictive and you never you never solve that problem you never master it but um, Something about that process is is highly, highly addictive to me and has been a real motivator in my life um, in terms of, you know, the guitar and improvisation. I would love to be better at it, but, um, you know, <laughs> it's it's a lifetime of, of, of work, basically. Of course. And I just want to mention to anyone listening, especially those in my audience who perhaps are more on the production side and don't, you know, haven't studied jazz or anything. A lot of people might have the impression that, especially when you come from a rock background, let's say, as a guitar player or as a listener, the sensation is that oftentimes solos are not improvised. They're they're through composed, and which is also a lot of fun to do. And secondly, they're often, you know, fairly in the same world, harmonically speaking, either like just in one key or, you know, borrowing from other modes, but it's very, very related and you can kind of just play a pentatonic scale over the whole thing. There's there's an aspect of this in case anyone's unaware of as chord changes are going by, you can actually reflect those chord changes in your solo. And this is what Tom and I are talking about right now and is is kind of like, let's say, the meat and potatoes of a lot of jazz study for soloists is about how to do this, how to thread coherent melodies while the notes and scale degrees you're playing are changing underneath you. And until you realize that that's a thing, you know, I didn't know that growing up. I, I, heard, I heard jazz here and there, right? And I thought, oh, you know, whatever, jazz, this, that. And I'd hear something I like and hear someone be like, this is like absolute garbage, as, you know, a, quite a lot of the world thinks, uh, understandably. Um, and, then, and then coming to realize, you know, okay, it's improvised. Yes, there is structure. There is like, a, there's a tune here that's being played. And there's a way generally in traditional jazz, it gets played. You know, you play the head or the melody, then blah, 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 solos and so on. And when you start to comprehend what goes into it, especially when you try it and you try to play over even just basic changes and you're not just like mindlessly playing a single scale over the whole chain, but you're trying to actually outline what the harmony is doing, you realize like this is not just some simple thing. And then when you hear these people playing at like tempos over 200 and the changes are coming like every two beats and it's just flying over all this. It's it's mind boggling to me how that is even possible and reaches heights of musicianship and creativity, you know, that are easily on par with anything else that goes on in the world, whether it be in other countries in India or classical Western music. You know, it gets to ridiculous heights of this, but it's spontaneous. And that's what I love about it. I wish I could do that. You know, it just sounds like, feel, seems like it would be such a blast to do. To me, it's um, the guys who, you know, my heroes in, in this world. So Jonathan Kreisberg, obviously you're a big fan of Jonathan, Chris Potter, um, you know, any, any of those big New York guys or, you know, LA guys, wherever. They are so fluent in the language that, you know, you, th there's no barrier to expression there for them in the immediate sense, um, and you can you can be rewarded internally with music for so many different reasons. I mean, for instance, 
there's something, you probably find this as well, there's something amazingly rewarding once you learn to sight read about experiencing a piece of music like you would read a book. So the story unfolds and you're almost passively, apart from the expression side of it, which you probably wouldn't do on a first playthrough, you would learn the piece and, you know, a good example I'm thinking of is the, a lot of guitar players learn the Bach violin sonatas and petitas because they're a great technique exercise apart from anything else. But Bach is particularly good for this because it's a, it's a little bit like jazz and it's a constant stream of 8th or 16th notes and he is beautifully painting the harmony. And you're experiencing this when you learn to sight read, you know, you can almost passively consume the music whilst playing it, which is an incredible experience. But on the other end of the scale, sitting down and listening to Jonathan Kreisberg creates something that has that level of coherence, but he's doing it in real time which Bach obviously did back in the day as well. You know, he was an incredible improviser. Um, is truly remarkable to me. It's like, uh, like you know, compositionally people can reach the upper echelons of, of, of a particular skill set. Experiencing those guys who've reached the upper echelons of improvisational skill to me is just a, a truly remarkable experience to see somebody who's got that good at their craft. You know, and I'm sort of clutching below trying to, Give me a bit of your skill. Um, but it's, you know, even at the level that I've got to, you know, with it, improvisation is so addictive. The, the, the skill set that's involved, the, um, the pleasure, when you get to the point where, and you're already there, of course, but when you get to the point where you can thread ideas through chord changes, even simple chord changes, there's something so beautiful and addictive and um, rewarding about that. Yeah, um, I agree. It's like yeah. a real-time puzzle, you know. That's I, it. I remember, um, oh, I just want to clarify, you're, you know, for anyone listening, you're insinuating that I can sight read and that is not the case. Uh, my, <laughs> my, sight, my sight reading is absolute trash. The closest that I get, you know, I've gotten in my life to fluent sight reading is playing Guitar Hero. I can tell you that. I can play okay, Guitar okay. Hero really well. Uh, otherwise, I can read music, but it's not fluent at all. So I, I'm assuming from what you're saying, it sounds like it's a great experience. I'll have to trust you on that. I, I can only, uh, I can sight read well if it's if it's monophonic material. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> monophonic yeah. material is not my not my bag as a guitar player, but it should be. But I never play classical, but monophonic material, like reading heads and, ch you know, uh, lead lines and stuff and, and bark is fine. Um, I certainly don't dabble on piano <laughs> sight reading. <laughs> It's Don't incredible the level that people get to on sight reading piano. Oh, Can yeah. you believe yeah, it? You yeah. watch that yeah. two hands at once. It's just like <laughs> it's two hands at once, two different clefts. Craziness, absolute craziness. I know, I know. This is so. You're talking there about Bach and and weaving lines and and improvising and all this. Oh, the quote I wanted to say before we get there is a Bill Evans quote, and it was in. Uh, he had some some documentary or something made about him lo a long time ago, obviously, about, uh, it's called The the Universal Mind or something like this. The music, The yeah, Universal Mind of Music, something, something to this effect. It's on yeah, YouTube yeah. for anyone that wants to check it out. It's very cool. And he says, uh, basically, he's, he's comparing and contrasting jazz with, I think, classical or, or any other form. And his way of phrasing is is that in jazz, it takes one minute to make one minute's music. And in anything else, it can take months to make one minute's music, you know, if you're writing a symphony or whatever you're doing. And I think that's a really interesting way to put it. And and that's what I love so much about improvisation, whether it's my own improvising or improvising in a jam setting, which I really, really love, where there's, where there's a fusion of everyone's energetic, you know, looking, feeling, doing, trying, playing, and stuff just organically arises. You hear something and you try something and then they get onto it. You know, I love that. And there's something about that a minute for a minute's music, you know, that really uh, scratches an itch that that composition can't scratch, of course. One, one of, oh, some, I should say some, of the most rewarding musical experiences I've ever had in my life have been in guitar duos, because it's quite an interesting scenario. And I would imagine it's probably the same for any any time you have two of the same instrument together and both players are versed in improvisation, the language of improvisation, if you like, because it is like learning or well, it's not like it is learning a language. Um, when you've got two guitar players together, th there can be a funny thing where, and we sort of talked about this the other night as well. If I listen to piano, I can be fooled by voicings and not be sure what's going on all the time because of clustering of notes that can't happen on guitar. Um, and the register, you know, the, the, the distance, literal distance of two hands that, you know, in terms of the register that you can achieve, um, you know, can, can be very different. 
Whereas with guitar, the sonic territory that guitar covers, I'm very, very familiar with. So when I play with another guitar player, I'm much more in tune with what they're doing and where I need to be on the instrument in relation to where they're playing on the instrument, either register-wise or rhythmically or whatever. And if you've got somebody who is as versed as you or more versed than you in terms of the improvisational language on that instrument, it is literally like this. It's like having a conversation and there is no barrier to expression provided you're at the same level or the other person is above you, you know, or vice versa, and you can both express yourselves fairly freely. You're not playing things that are at the extremes of your ability. It is a truly, truly remarkable experience to have that musical journey with each other. Um, you know, you, you, over, over the years, you know, as, as kind of guitar has become, electric guitar has become really popular. You've, you know, you see lots of people doing clinics and so on and so forth. And obviously as an Ibanez artist, I've done lots of clinics for Ibanez. But unlike most clinics, uh, I did, I think it was 70 odd clinics with Martin Miller. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them was completely unique because we were basically doing guitar, improvised guitar duets. And that feeling of sitting in front of an audience, not sure what's gonna happen. <laughs> but you go on a completely different journey every single night. We, we did, um, there's a standard called How Insensitive, um, which you, you might know. Uh, it's like a, a Latin bossa kind of vibe, very dark, beautiful, uh, minor based melody. And we would do like a 12 minute exposition on this thing every single night at the end of the show. And it was different every single night. And, you know, by the, 50th time you've done it it's still different but you've honed the ability to hear where each other's going to go so you can follow each other and the conversations you can have for just there's no again it all comes back to this thing that this is a unique artistic uh ex, you know s system of expression basically there is no other way that i could have that experience with another human being interacting like that you know except for having a conversation you know and and in a, in a conversation it's quite different because we, we all, I don't really know how to describe this. There's something very different about having an improvised musical conversation with somebody on an instrument and creating something that is sonically beautiful or has meaning, um, you know, as opposed to a conversation that can be beautiful and have meaning, of course, and can really affect other people. And, you know, you can really change your mindset on things and, and have a very meaningful impact on you for sure. But music for some reason just seems to, I don't know, it, it has a, for me, it has more of an impact on uh, a longer lasting impact when you're interacting with, with another musician in that way. It's just such an amazing experience. Um, I wish everybody could have that experience, <laughs> you know, it would be amazing. I know I the world, I, the world would be a better place. Actually. I, I know. I totally understand what you mean. I, I have some friends that I've had throughout my life that, uh, are on roughly the same wavelength as me in terms of instrument ability and especially other guitar players. And I know exactly that experience of improvising kind of endlessly with them. And and despite what the uh, titles of instrumental music will tell you, music doesn't translate into language actually, right? It's mm. its own thing with its, with its own meaning that just is what it is, but you can't say what it is. You know, it yeah. feels just like that, and that's all it is. And mm -hmm. that happens in the moment of improvisation. Sometimes, you know, stuff bubbles up. Something happens, they're doing, you hear and you're doing, and you look at each other and it's just like, oh, wow. You know, it gets this giddy kind of hype gets built when something is just occurring out of nowhere that that you could never do on your own. I would never have thought to do that until that person started doing it and then it brought it out in me and then they start reacting, you know? It's it's something that is just like, it's electric, it feels electric. I think also, uh, this has only just occurred to me, so this might not be a particularly coherent thought, but you know, you, the, the, in a conversation, you tend to talk and then listen. So you stop and then you talk and then you listen. You, you're thinking about what the other person said. And it's, it's one person at a time. That's, it has to be that way, of course. But in music, it's a constant two-way conversation. And it's this, this very complex weaving of harmony and rhythm together, and especially in an improvised context, where it's never, that's the other thing, it's never perfect. It can't be perfect because there isn't any time to perfect it. It has to be the best you can do in that moment, but can never be perfect. And I think, again, 
perhaps that's a little bit of a cliche because people, you know, you, you cannot you cannot make it perfect. It's always got a slightly rough edge to it. Even the people who are at the real upper echelons, I'm sure if they had another go at it and they could they could literally sit down and perfect it, <laughs> they would have played a different solo. Yeah. But there's something about that interaction that's not perfect. Everything happening at the same time, it builds and builds and builds. You know, it's it's a a remarkable experience that again cannot be achieved in any other way. Um, I feel like there's some kind of weird innuendo happening here at the same time, but it's not meant to be. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, it's it's amazing. This is this is uh, remind me of something I wanted to ask you before, but I I forgot. Do you know? Uh, I don't think I asked you. Do you know who Ted Green is? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. So for those that don't know in the audience, Ted Green uh, passed away in 2005, but is. Um, let's say, I don't know, I hesitate to call him a jazz guitar player, but let's say jazz guitar player, but of the chord melody style, meaning you're playing the harmony and the melody at the same time, primarily that's what he did. But he also played a whole bunch of other styles, blues and rock and, and Baroque and all sorts of stuff. Massively influential person in my life. When I discovered Ted Green, I, I actually, when I, I bought Ted Green's book, uh, Chord Chemistry, just because of the name when I was like 15, and it was, I was like, what am I looking at? You know, I just like, yeah. put on the shelf yeah, for Same years here. and years. Then yeah. I discovered him again later in life through YouTube and realized, you know, his students had filmed so much of him. And I was, I was just, and still am, utterly blown away by, by what he did. And I, don't, I won't, you know, digress into this too much here, but it, it, it pertains to the topic, which is that this is a person, he's not improvising with anybody else, although he does do that too. Um, but he's improvising songs that he knows the melody to, and he he can hear the harmony in real time, creating voicings on the guitar that work in real time, reharmonizing, changing it, and speak about what he's doing in the moment, switch into a Baroque style of the same thing, back into jazz style, into a blues style, into two note voicings, three note voicings, four to five, you know, like this, and it has the same quality as watching this edge of your seat quality, you know, when you're watching two people improvise, when you understand that they're improvising. And like you say, the rough around the edges, everything Ted does is rough around the edges. There's no perfection there, so to speak. But that's it, right? That's what so hooks you is like, oh, is he going to fail? And, you know, and he just keeps going. And then sometimes he does. And just like real people, when they're improvising, you hit wrong notes, but that's part of it, right? And it, it that's what makes it so exciting. It's... I've never really spoken to anybody about it. Well, maybe I have, but not, you know, in public as this is, as this is really. Um, it's interesting thinking back to the first time I ever heard Ted Green or anybody of that extraordinary level. Because to me, it, it was equal parts totally inspirational and mind-blowing and also equal parts incredibly painful, actually. Not in a bad way. I don't mean in terms of like a jealous way. I just mean in terms of realizing that it was very unlikely. I mean, when I listen to it, I, it's so beautiful and such a remarkable achievement that I was desperate to be able to create something like that. Really desperate, you know. It was all I could think about. And when I listened to it, the reaction I had to it was so visceral and so addictive that when I picked up the instrument, and I couldn't create that kind of thing. And then I realized, and this is, I think this is something you just have to go through as a musician. And I don't think enough people talk about it. You do go through a realization where you understand that that's not possible for you. And it could, it could be all sorts of things. You know, it could be something very simple, like the, a technique that you find difficult, or it could be something much more profound. Like I can't create the level of beauty and sophistication that Ted Green's creating. I mean, of course, then you have the realization that very, very few people can. But I remember the first time I ever heard, again, I mentioned him earlier, Jacob Collier for the, you know, for the first time. And I thought, man, that harmony is having an effect on me that I can't explain. <laughs> I, th I thought I understood harmony really quite well, but it would appear that there is a <laughs> significant level above my understanding that seems to be out of reach for me. And again, it's not, a, it's not a negative thing. I'm not trying to be negative about it, but there is, artistic pursuits are very interesting in that they can often be quite painful pursuits as well. They're not always. So I've described music as this very addictive, beautiful, wonderful, incredible thing. But 
it, when it's been interesting to me throughout my life trying to do this skill, this improvisational thing particularly, and Ted Green, obviously, it was improvised what he was doing, trying to achieve this to a very high level, being totally addicted to the aesthetic of it, the puzzle element of it, the physicality, the technique of it, and the puzzle of the guitar, of course, because the guitar is a particular puzzle unto itself. It can, it, sometimes it's tinged with elements of, of um, almost physical pain, like not, not realising that you're not going to be able to achieve the things that you wanted to achieve. And of course, those are useful because they push you in certain directions. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to make a note of that, that I remember that feeling with Ted Green as well, both being incredibly in awe and such beauty, being totally inspired by it, but also being having feelings of quite visceral pain listening to it. There was another example. Um, there's a Pat Metheny and Charlie Hayden album called Beyond the Missouri Sky. Mm -hmm. And it's the tune called Tears of Rain, I think it's called. I can't remember. It's towards the end of the album. And Pat Metheny plays a solo on, um, I think it's an electric sitar sound that he has. Yeah. And this solo, the first time I ever heard it, again, it was equal parts that is the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard. How staggeringly, like I couldn't believe the way it made me feel, but at the same time, the realization that I want to create those sounds <laughs> and I will never be able to do that to that level is a very humbling, very human reaction to something, of course. Um, you know, but I just find it interesting that I don't think people talk about that enough. You know, I think it's quite important that you, you those are things that musicians, any artists have to deal with the humbling nature of that's the thing I want to achieve, but that is possibly beyond my achievement. And at the age of what well, I'm 42 now, I've realized that some of those things are beyond my reach, but you just have to learn to deal with that and, you know, do the thing that you're, you know, that is within your ability, you know. Exactly. Which what's in your ability is utterly unique because it's this amalgamation of your physiology, biology, mind, way of seeing, blah, 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 blah. And other people, myself looking at you look at you and like have the same feeling right you know how much how much can i watch of of what tom does before i either start crying out of joy or out of sadness because i'm never going to do it you know to the same degree but i don't have to you know i don't have to i can do exactly what i can do and of course you understand that that's totally fine and that's the nature of art right is that what really makes the art is not the technical knowledge or the practice or whatever but is the way of seeing the way of hearing the way of interpreting and you cannot give that to anybody else. You cannot give your, and nor would you need to or want to, give your way of understanding life and music and anything to somebody. You can tell them every little bit of knowledge, you know, answer every question, but you cannot give that, which is how do you actually put it together? How do you actually mm -hmm. use that? And I, it's funny enough regarding Jacob, um, I spoke to, to June Lee once. You know June? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's the guy that transcribes all of Jacob's stuff, and he's done some conversations with him about theory and such. I had an opportunity to talk to June one time online, and um, he said something along this way that I thought, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was quite profound in that um, we were talking about, you know, one of these ideas that Jacob has about theory that you know you've never heard anybody say before, which is like everything that he says, right? <laughs> and so we were talking about this thing. And, and June said something to the effect of like, you know, Jacob says that it's like this and this, but he's like, I don't know, you know, I don't really hear it that way. And he does. And that's, I don't know, I have anything else to say about it. And I thought, hmm, you know, coming from like my, my background of being, like I said, quite, quite intellectual, wanting to understand, wanting to get it right, wanting to know whatever, to, to have this come back and be like, ah, oh, maybe it's not that it's right or wrong. This is the true way to understand it, but that it's his way of understanding it. And as such, that allows him to do what he's doing. But I cannot embody that. I cannot mm -hmm. embody his way of understanding it and produce what he produces. That's just, you know, of course, that's mimicry, but it's not even mimicry. I'm not even going to get there, right? It's not going to be anything. And, and the, just to touch on this subject a little bit further, I don't think we've mentioned this in our conversations before. I have a, a teacher in my life, just an unbelievable, you know, musical god, let's say, that I that I have the pleasure of being able to study with from time to time. And um, he's now 84 or so. And he 
he, he's written many books on music and a, a tome, a real tome of harmony, just unbelievable deep study. It's called uh, Harmonic Experience. If anybody wants to check it out, his name's W.A. Wow. Matthew, Harmonic Experience. And it's about the experience of harmony from its tonal or from its uh, origins in singing and feeling through the development of equal temperament and how equal temperament works and the kinds of things you can do with it and so on. Um, anyway, I just giving this for context, I was in a lesson with him one time. And um, I asked him, you know, this man who has studied this his entire life and written so much music. And I said, you know, why does five lead to one? And because uh, if anyone is unaware, five leading to one in terms of chords, the five chord leading to the one chord, this is like the golden rule of harmony, Western harmony, five leads to one. Everybody knows that five leads to one. So why does five lead to one? He's like, I don't know. Hmm. And I said... That, that was honestly like one of the biggest turning points in my musical career. To have this guru of harmony, I ask him the most basic, why does it happen? And he says, I don't know. And I mean, of course, we all have a, I can, why is five lead to one? I can tell you 10,000 reasons why five leads to one, I think, you know, but, but that little phrase in itself refigured my whole way of understanding music, you know, in a moment. It's totally fascinating to me this whole concept because, I mean, yeah, why does five lead to one? I mean, I mentioned the harmonic series before, which is something that happens naturally within, you know, it's, it's a natural occurrence. And that if that's laid out in a certain way and certain tones are put with other, other tones, that there is a pull to another series of tones. It's just bizarre. And I, I don't know whether it's human conditioning whether we've heard it so many times that now we can't unhear it, and if you went somewhere else in the world, they wouldn't be able to hear it. I, I don't know enough about that as to whether that's the case. Obviously, you know, you go to North North India and it's a completely different setup of, uh, you know, both rhythmically and harmonically, you know, it's it's a completely different uh, setup. And South India is, is, is different again, you know, various different parts of the world treat music very differently, but is that a human condition? that five leads to one. I don't know. You know, yeah, why, right. why does that happen in nature? You know, it's a natural, I know it doesn't happen in nature, as per se, but it's a natural process. It's not, you know, it's just something that we just discovered that existed in, in, in the universe. It's very, very bizarre, incredible. Exactly. And I think it touches on a really important point here about kind of reality and science and everything all together, which is that what we're essentially doing with our language is describing what happens, not describing why something happens. Maybe given within a kind of framework, if we ignore all this stuff we don't understand and say, you know, within this little kind of view, yeah, this leads to this because of this. But then we're like a child, you know, the child, why? Yeah. But why? But why? But why? Until the parent is like, and and that that moment of this, that's the point, right? You don't actually get to something concrete. The more that you ask why, it just dissolves into like, why is anything anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, and that's what this moment had uh, did for me because his book is so so wrapped around the harmonic series. It is the through line through the entire thing. You know, maps it out how to sing it, how to feel it, how that evolves into harmony, why we use it. It's like the best book ever, as far I'm as gonna, harmony. You're gonna have to get go. that book. Yeah. You're gonna have to trust me. Yeah. And anyway, so he's the guy. And to top it off, he studied with Pandit Pranath, this uh, North Indian raga singer, for three decades. You know, like live with the guy, bathe the guy till he died, kind of situation. So singing North Indian raga singing is deep, deep, deep in his way of teaching, as is jazz. You know, he wrote big band music in the 60s and wrote for Downbeat Magazine and all this stuff, composed classical, plays classical. Ridiculous. Uh, is it a unified concept that he has for all of these things? I mean, yeah. in terms of his tuition, so he's not, you know, separating those concepts out in terms of ragas and, you know, the a drone and, you know, the, the, I, I suppose, though, it's, it, it's all the same thing. I mean, basically, you have a central point of reference from which you hear all of the pitches moving away from and then feeling a pull back to a sense of resolution. Why does that sense of resolution, why does one pitch have that gravity? It's so strange. There's, I there's, mean, there's physics behind it, I guess, but, um, you know. 
I it's think interesting. The, the furthest on, that that I, that I can get with it, to you know, not that I can explain this at all, but it's similar to a, to a process of factoring, in which you know, presented with a given set of frequencies, your ear, mind, whatever it is, brain, whatever you want to say, will immediately factor what it's hearing and find mm. the tone that generates all the rest. If it's unable to find it, you will experience the sound as noise. And yeah, yeah, if, right. in, if it can find it, you will immediately experience a set of relationships that become instantly apparent to you, right? And there's an interesting analog to this in jazz harmony. Many, many young people and and people who just go through life without listening to jazz harmony, especially really dense stuff, you know, um, hear that kind of stuff and it sounds like noise to them, sounds like nothing, yep. right? Especially when you hear... Sh- you know, the chord is not held long, short little stabs of dense harmony, right? You don't have enough time because this process of factoring can be improved. Your ear can improve over time to factor quicker. But if it, if your ear has not learned how to do it, you will not experience a satisfying sensation when you hear some 13 flat nine chord, you know, basically, you'd just be like, this is trash, right? But then mm. funny enough, exposure to it, think of like uh Think of the first time you had coffee, the first time you had beer. So bitter. Who would ever drink this? Eventually, you're like, where's the beer at? You know, like you're obsessed with it. You can't wait. You you get accustomed to bitterness. You're, you're Something about your your body can make sense of the, the complexity. And then eventually you want nothing else, right? It's That's it's it. Fascinating. It becomes very addictive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Much the same as beer if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, I mean... <laughs> It is, it is utterly, utterly fascinating to me. Um, it's, it's not some, I've been so obsessed with just understanding how harmony works from a, the literal sense of combining chords that I haven't looked enough into the, you know, the, the more kind of, um, you know, why does the literal sense of why does harmony work? You know, the, 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 the physics of it, the, the human, physiology why does our brain interpret it this way it's something i should actually look into more i think you've done more of that haven't you you've explored that in in some more significant ways yeah um, pretty obsessed than with i it. have yeah it's in, very interesting I'd, I'd love to know more about it you'll have to give us i mean that book sounds fascinating but you'll have to give us some more resources for you know uh how to explore this further because it is really really fascinating it changes your whole way of understanding what it is you're even doing when you say you're mm. listening to or making music you know it, it gives a whole different perspective and I, you know I came up thinking theory maybe like you're like you're describing as kind of again it's it's leaving out this fundamental why but is instead mm. saying well we know five goes to one so given that five goes to one flat two can go to one did you know tritone substitution and because of that this 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 which is all totally valid and wonderful because these are basically maps for making particular types of sounds. That's all they are. But the idea that these maps are the way it really works, you know, is, is is ludicrous, right? These are just stumbling upon things, little formulas to produce certain sounds. Yeah. And I, I always wondered, there's a fundamental question I had at some point. I said, are notes real? Like... <laughs> Uh, or, or are they just like random things that humans have just picked up out of, out of thin air and like, yeah, we like these ones. You know, is there actually like a fundamental thing? And obviously you're already onto it with the harmonic series and understanding relation, relationships between ratios and all this. So yes, notes are real, so to speak. They're a real universal phenomenon and their harmony is. That that was a, a kind of burning question in me that led to finding this book and led to speaking with him and all that. So I, you're going to love it, I think. There was a... A really fun thing that happened to me recently, which obviously I was fully aware of before this point, but I'd never done it in such a um, a tangible way. With the synths, where um, I have a, um, a Prophet 6, and one of the oscillators can be set to be a low-frequency oscillator. And as you go through the range, where suddenly a note becomes just a series of disparate clicks, and you realise in a very tangible way, what sound is, what notes are. They're just a series of, <laughs> of oscillating waveforms that just happen to be interpreted by the human brain as a pitch when they get to a certain frequency. But as you dial down the frequency, you can hear these disparate clicks of the waveform. It's a very strange experience to realise that that's basically what you're listening to, but just very, very rapidly. 
I know. It's very it's amazing. strange. Sound is odd, very odd indeed. It's very odd. It's like you come across a failing of your uh, yep. mind's ability to parse this stuff. That's it. And in yeah, doing exactly. so, it becomes a whole new phenomenon. <laughs> and yep. then you can combine those together and they produce chords and stuff. Like, what is that? You know? Essentially, you're doing <laughs> the equivalent orally of an optical illusion, effectively. Your exactly. brain is convincing you that you're hearing something which is actually something else. You know, it's just you can't, as you say, pass the gaps between the oscillations of the waveforms. Exactly. It's very strange, very strange when you think about it. There's a funny technique that uh, I use in sound design where we exploit this. And instead of using an oscillator, I mean, you're still using an oscillator, I guess you could say, you, you're using a sample. And you're playing back, say, you choose a kick sample, and you play it back fast enough that the kick becomes a pitch. And then you're mm. actually changing the timbre of the synth uh, by changing your kick sample. And every time you change the kick sample, you get a new all these different versions of it, oh, yeah. right? And then that can become your bass sound instead of using a sine wave or anything like that. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, I mean, sound becomes very difficult to... We, we have a grasp on it, but as soon as you get into the synth world and you start doing things like frequency modulation, you know, the logic of it, that you think you understand how sound works, and as <laughs> soon as the sound starts oscillating, the you know, the... The, the, the frequency of the waveform gets faster, the pitch goes up. But then you start doing frequency modulation, the logic, the logical thread behind it falls to pieces very quickly for human beings. Um, and again, that to me is fast. I don't understand it at all, but it's fascinating <laughs> to me what's going on there. I know. Um, all, all of that stuff that goes on in synths is its own whole study, right? When you start to get in there and start to realize this stuff is really happening and it's producing usable sounds, especially when you're using analog sense and you're you're just manipulating voltages that that are pushing and pulling each other's frequency and all this it's just you know it's beyond comprehension but but it's so much fun and it's so fascinating yeah absolutely i'm, I'm fully addicted at this point and unfortunately it's quite an expensive hobby <laughs> yeah no i understand i try to stay out of the hardware thing myself yeah you were saying yeah absolutely <laughs> good idea so mm. i want to uh circle back just a little bit we were talking about melody and improvisation and all this and um, oh, first I want to touch on, you have a, you have an app that is about this, that is about improvising. Can you just talk about it for a second so people understand? Yeah. So the app is called Solo. Um, and effectively it was originally designed to help my business partner and I, I have a, a guy called, uh, my business partner's called David Beebe. He's a great guitar player. And we would, or I found a method of trying to solve the puzzle of the guitar, which is a very visual instrument, by using the smallest possible visual uh, unit, if you like, which to me was a thing called the intervallic function, which is basically a two point shape from a root note to a particular interval. How does that, you know, the function of that interval, so like a five or a two or a three. I visualize those as, as a, a two point sort of shape from the root notes to what does it look like to go to that interval, that intervallic function? What does the two look like against the root note? What does the flat three look at, like against the root note? And I do that within an octave ascending or descending from a given root note. And then if you learn what those shapes look like, if you know what intervals are in a particular harmonic uh, device, so for example, like a really simple, um, let's say the Lydian scale, it's a one, a two, a three, sharp four, five, six, and seven. If you know what those intervals look like visually against the given root notes, on the guitar, they, they never change. So a seven always, doesn't matter which root note you pick, it looks the same on the guitar. A seven will always look the same. It's not the same on piano, which I discussed with you the other day has caused me all manner of problems <laughs> trying to learn piano. And the app was originally designed to help guitar players learn this method, but, we quickly realized that you that you can't teach, you know, you'd, you'd need a series of videos to teach people how to do this. So actually what it ended up being was an app that would allow guitar players initially to learn how the notes they're playing relates to the chords and scales that they're using at the time. So guitar players are, are particularly bad because of the, um, the visual nature of the instrument of just learning large shapes and then, then just playing the shape, just, just existing within the shape. So a really cliched example of that is the minor pentatonic scale. Everybody learns the minor pentatonic scale 
and then you kind of shut your eyes and go for it and just play notes within the scale without really thinking too hard about, okay, now I'm playing the flat three. How does that flat three sound and interact with the chord that I'm playing over? If I wanted to target that flat three specifically by, by visually finding it and then orally understanding how it sounded, can I do that or am I just playing a shape, a large shape? And the app basically is designed that it understands what you're playing orally and so a little bit like a very sophisticated tuner. It says, okay, the note that you're playing, I want you to play the flat three over this chord. So it says an A minor seven, for example, I want you to find the flat three. And it doesn't tell you what note it is. You have to find the flat three. And, you know, then it might ask you for the flat seven. It might ask you for the five. It might ask you for the four, for example. And it goes on like this through chord progressions and scales. So if you practice with it a lot, you develop a really uh, good synergy between the, the shape-based nature of the guitar and also how do those shapes and notes that you're playing specifically relate to the harmony that you're playing over, be it visualizing a scale, an arpeggio, a chord voicing, whatever, basically. Um, however, what we quickly learned was that it's also very useful for piano players, for singers, for horn players. It's not just a guitaristic tool. So we've got an army of people now using this app <laughs> for all sorts of different instruments. And it's a really useful ear training tool as well for singing through intervals um, as well. So yeah, that's the app um, on iOS and Android. So yeah. Yeah, I love it. And I actually use it for the for the singing. I'm, I'm, I'm right. interested in that exactly. I wanna see a chord here. I wanna hear the chord, which I'm gonna have to play that. And then I yeah. wanna sing that interval that it's, you know, but once I hear it once, then the question is just give me as many as possible and I wanna sing all those intervals, right? You know, that's, I, I love it. So. I appreciate you making that. I think it's a great, <laughs> a great That's innovation. Great. And yeah. following on from that, um, I want to ask. Just this, this just occurred to me like a month ago or two months ago. What's the point of a solo? Who? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Yeah. It's kind of like a given, right? You kind of feel, yeah, there's solos. Of course there's solos. Yeah. Guitar solos and jazz, we solo, and, you know, it's like self-expression, man. That's all it is. But, like, what is it? What's the point? This is a really good question because I think there's a difference between what is the point of an improvised solo in a jazz context or a modern take of what a solo is and, you know, a solo like in a through-composed classical sense back in the day, like an Elgar violin concerto, for example, which was just a long solo, but it was a through composed, highly expressive, formed in a very perfect way to, to, to hit this golden ratio, you know, three quarters of the way through or whatever. It's, I don't, I've never thought about that actually. What's the point in terms of modern improvisational context? of a solo. I know that's not what you asked. You asked generally what's the point of a solo. No, no, but that that's but generally just... what I mean is less about the classical thing, which, you know, let's just call the classical thing a melody for argument's sake for now. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's just a composed melody and let's say an improvised solo. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I, like you say, it is just a given um, that solos are, the, they're, they're actually the main point of of jazz and improvised music. So it's it's actually remarkable. I've never thought about that before. Um, well, let's think about it this way first then. We'll come back to this. What makes a good solo? How do you know when a solo is good? Well, it could be also, it depends on the, the listener. Um, because for me, I could have very different requirements of a good solo than somebody else. As a guitar player, for example, I might be listening for particular facets of a guitar solo uh, and might have very different opinions as to the same solo being played on a piano. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing, mm -hmm. but my affinity with the instrument might lead me to think a solo is good when other musicians wouldn't necessarily think so. Um, but for me, obviously, it has to move me and mean something. It has to fulfill the harmonic and rhythmic qualities of that particular genre. Um, it has to be, solos for me have to be, they, they, they have to have some feature, some facet of them that either excites or 
creates beauty or um, they have to say something in relation to the existing harmonic context. Um, but for me, I mean, they can they can simply be a good solution to a puzzle for me as well, you know, going back to what we talked about before. A good, logical, well-threaded solution to a puzzle can often be a good solo. Again, a good a good solo, it gets so, so dependent on context, a good solo of a Giant Steps or 26-2 can be a very different solution and a very good for a very different reason to a good solo over, say, um, a minor blues, for example, or listening to Jeff Black play a great solo over Somewhere Over the Rainbow. The two things are very different to each other. I don't know if you can have a unified answer to that question particularly. I mean, do you have a unified quality that makes a good solo? I don't know. <laughs> what I can say, though, is that the first thing that hits me in a solo is, like with anything we were talking about earlier, the the immediate, unmediated uh impact of it on me experientially you know i before i even know what's happening there's this quality of like excitement you know hanging on every mm -hmm. note like you know it's suddenly there's all this kind of structure that's been happening and all of a sudden the structure breaks and and something new starts going and and it has to make you want to follow and and that you have to be rewarded for following that's my sensation that when I give my attention to that thing, it moves in ways that I either don't expect, or I don't know how to phrase that, but you know what I mean? It's doing things yep. that, like you say, excite me and, and pull my attention along. It can be playful, it can be serious. The specifics don't so much matter. And surely it's, it's as subjective as any music is about what is truly a good solo. There's no objectively good solo, but, but for each person, it will have some, some immediate quality. However, it can be tempered, as all music can, for better or worse, with intellectual ideas that come later yeah. that the... Uh, sorry, my Skype is open. I don't know if that came through to you there. Close that. Uh, sorry. So the, it can be tempered with other ideas that are musical in nature, such as, oh, he's using X scale over this. That's a modal change. Oh, he's playing out right now. Oh, it's oh, it's that, you know, uh, upper structure triad over this, which a general listener has no clue or care Absolutely. of yeah, at man. all, right? So is the solo actually designed for a listener? Is the solo designed for, I mean, I'm saying designed, improvised. Is the solo improvised for uh, a musician? Is the solo improvised for oneself, which, let's say, disregards the other two, but may, you know, Venn diagram style go across them as well. Yeah. You know, some random thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, I know that like, for example, to give, give, give a, a literal example, one of my favorite things in music is in the context of multiple solos happening one after the other, if a solo has reached a particular um, peak, if you like, and then the band just drops to almost nothing. And then there's this moment of wonder of thinking, right, where is this next soloist going to go? Things have moved all the way down to zero again. And now there is a almost limitless number of possibilities to where this person could go. And waiting for that very first phrase to happen. And then the anticipation of the buildup that's about to happen with a solo. Um, is a very, very exciting moment musically for me. Much more, I mean, it's almost like in, in a jazz context, in a fusion context, the melody happens and there can be very interesting interpretations of the melody. The arrangement could be interesting. Someone might do something very interesting in, in an old time signature, for example, with a melody. In fact, that's, that's where the jazz world has moved. People have tried to have interesting interpretations of standards, for example, or write kind of crazy heads. But realistically, the audience is there for that moment when the head ends and then the solos start and the wonder and anticipation of what's going to happen at that point. And I guess provided that there is some kind of emotional payoff at the end of that solo in terms of you've been on some kind of a journey and it's not just this all the way across, which I know I've done many times in my life, <laughs> um, you know, that is a good solo, in my opinion. You know, for me, that's what I look for in a solo. That there's a there's a start point and an end point and a coherent journey along the way that you as the listener, or actually as the soloist, because that's one of the addictive things about improvisation, is that you're going on that journey as well. You don't know where the where it's gonna go. You know how the head's gonna go. You know how what how the arrangement goes. The thing you don't know is where your solo is gonna go. 
um, and nor did the audience. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about a good solo. It's gone on a journey and you've taken the audience with you. And that's exciting in and of itself. That's enough, you know, provided all the elements of music are there, you're not like screwing the harmony up or rhythmically you're, you know, you've got to be able to talk the language. But if you can talk the language and you take the, the audience on some kind of a journey, then that's a good solo for me in an improvised context. I've never really thought about it beyond that though, that you, you're you giving me, I knew you would, but you're giving me <laughs> things to take away and think about. This is interesting. Yeah, so we'll, maybe we'll talk about this again in the future. What's the point? What's the point of a solo? And and mm. there is, is there a point? I don't know. But there's it's surely uh, very pervasive, not just in Western music, but, but most Eastern styles, yep. including the raga we're talking about, are entirely about the solo in the way that jazz is, but it's not over changes, it's over a drone, and it has more restrictions placed on it most of the time in terms of w ways that you move and how you phrase and all this kind of thing. A lot of and rhythmic limitations, e yeah. Exactly, that's, you know, but that's a multi-century um, <laughs> endeavor, art form, and people gather in the thousands, in the millions to listen to people do this, you know, to, to just weave a yep. sonic exploration, a sonic journey over to, yep. I know that's all that's going on there. And then there's just all this. So clearly there's something very, very human and, you know, something there that we love. But again, it's very hard to articulate what that is. Yeah, I've never, I think I've been so involved with the process. I've never really stopped to think about what's going on in terms of the way that we experience it and why we're even doing it in the first place. Again, similar with harmony. Never really, I have very briefly, but never really stopped to think too hard about the why. Why is this happening? Why why the hell are we actually even able to do this? You know, Why are all these people sat in a room together listening to somebody play a solo <laughs> over a series of chord changes? It's, it's actually very bizarre. <laughs> it's bizarre. <laughs> really strange. Um, but again, a, a, a fairly universal experience. It's a human condition, you know? Yeah. We seem to have to do it. There's no way around it. I mean, if you I, leave, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, if you leave people in a room long enough with objects, they'll start banging them together and making music, basically. You know, <laughs> exactly. Some description. The thing is that that our lives are purely experiential. They're a flow of experience that, unless you're having it, you cannot describe or say to anyone else what it is. And as such, all we're basically doing is is enjoying experience in the ways that make sense to us as an individual you know we and and music is some kind of enjoyable experience how and why can we even say i don't know why is art enjoyable why are mu movies video games you know they're they're all they're not objects they're not things just sitting out there they're they're experiences that happen to you and that mm -hmm. is the point right that's what we like about it is that experiential quality that beyond that i don't know what to say about it but it's fun to think about yeah, absolutely. Um, and certainly this conversation, again, I, I kind of knew it would because I know that you think about these things a lot, but it is fascinating to try to, it's, it's sort of a philosophical approach to music really, because I spend so much of my time with the matter of factness of, of the, the, the sort of language based element of it. So the rules, as you were saying before, you know, why does this, uh, triad sound this way with this bass note, or actually not even why, the rules of if you combine this triad with this bass note, you get this. So X plus Y equals Z, you know. And those things have fascinated me for such a long time because cataloging those things and being able to, to utilize them allows you to speak the language, as it were, but didn't stop for very long to think about, well, hang on, what is X? What is Y? <laughs> Why on earth should they even be there? And, you know, what, what are the building blocks of those? And uh, why are we even doing this in the first place? It is very interesting. You've certainly given me food for thought in that respect. So this uh, slides into another topic I wanted to talk to you about, which is, uh, let's put it under the broad category of education, learning and teaching, of which you've done both. Uh, you did go to music school, um, studied jazz, correct? Yep. Yep. And so, as a preliminary question, it's very simple. Do you feel that school is important, and would you do it again if you did it over? 
No, I don't feel school is important. Um, I, I, I've come to the conclusion I think a lot of people come to, which is what it gives you is four years or three years, depending on where you are, of an excuse to do nothing, literally nothing, but consume and work on your um, your art, if you like, or your ability on the instrument. So you tend to find a lot of people who go to music school, if they're serious about it, that's the most intense series of practice, oh, sorry, the most intense amount of practice they will ever do in their lifetime. Because you literally don't have any other responsibilities apart from the odd essay here and there and, you know, assignments to do. Uh, you can just do that all day and you're surrounded by like-minded people. However, my experience with it and a lot of people who, you know, having spoken to a lot of people that I attended jazz college with post attending the college and having taught a lot of people who've been to music school at this point in my life, it's quite compromised in terms of an educational experience. I don't know many people who've come out and are 100% satisfied with their experience. Um, because it depends on, education is, is quite hard to get that perfect for each individual. And to teach music is quite difficult. You can teach the nuts and bolts of it. And that can also be done quite poorly. You know, I, whilst I appreciated my time at Leeds College of Music doing my jazz degree, not all of the tuition was particularly good. I think at points I was more confused than I should have been. And I learned a lot from, you know, either self-learning or from other people who were attending the course and we were exchanging information. I think the production line of, of churning students in and out is not necessarily the best way to learn. So if you are a very diligent, studious person who's, who's addicted already and is going to do all the work yourself, then it's an amazing way to have a bunch of time over a course of a few years to do nothing but, but learn your instrument and really hone your skills. If you're somebody who thinks that you're going to go in and be fed all this information and come out the other end like a production line as an amazing player, you will be sorely disappointed, I think. I don't think it works that way. Very rarely, anyway. Um, and also, these days, there is also the factor of it's insanely expensive. I know. Truly, truly ridiculously expensive. It's unbelievable. I don't know what it's like where you are, but, I mean, in the UK, it's always been historically significantly cheaper to study than it has been in North America, but now it's getting up there, you know, it's yeah. really, really insane Ten, money. Tens of thousands of dollars easy, depending yeah. on where you go, can be much more than that. Yeah. So I find it difficult to, I get asked a lot whether, you know, should I go to school? And, you know, if, if like I said, if you're somebody who's very studious and, and is good at self-learning, I think it can be a good thing, provided you understand that you're going to come out with enormous amounts of debt and you're okay with that and everyone else in your life is okay with that, <laughs> then that, that's one thing. I mean, when I did it, it was very cheap. It was £1,000 a year. That was it. Wow. You know? Yeah, as I say, historically in the UK, it's been quite cheap. I mean, if I'd have gone two years before that, it wouldn't have cost me anything. Um, but... Yeah, now it's so expensive. I think it has to be tempered with that because music is not... Oh, actually, I was going to say music is not a career that that, that has historically had a, a big earning potential. But actually, these days, there is potential to earn good money as a musician because of the internet. Um, there's a lot more opportunity. But still, it's a very saturated industry. And I think it's very easy to go in to a, a, a music degree or course, very optimistic, thinking... I'm, excuse my French, I'm the shit and I'm going to come out and I'm going to be the guy, which is a good thing. You know, you should, you should be very confident in your skills and you should, you should, you should have the desire. But I know a lot of people who've been very disappointed um, at the end of the whole thing and, and not necessarily achieve what they set out to achieve. And it can, it's difficult. Uh, whereas I know other people like my, but we talked about him the other day, my buddy Scott Divine, you know, Scott, who did just maybe one or two years of that. And then he went and studied with Gary Husband for a, f a few years over in Barcelona and learned a lot more doing that than he would have done going to music college. So yeah, it's a tricky one, especially these days. So you made an interesting point there, which I, I would not have said. Now, I didn't go to music school, so I can't speak to yeah. it at all. And I, I tried actually multiple times and we will we'll leave the reasons as to why I didn't go there off this conversation for now. But let's say it didn't work out. And I had always assumed if you're the kind of person that is not 
self-directed, studious, you should go to music school because you're going to be forced to do it. You're going to have, you know, you're going to be graded essentially and others are going to be doing it around you and perhaps that's going to help you. But I totally understand now, you know, what you're saying there. And I am a very much autodidactic, self-learned, blah, blah, blah Same kind here. of guy. So when I didn't go, it was, it was fine. In fact, probably better. I ended up being able to pursue exactly what I wanted to all the time. And it was at a time in my life where I did still have some time. I wasn't a teenager anymore, but I st did still have some time I could carve out to study. I mean, I still do, but not like it was back then. That's the one draw that, you know, I certainly don't regret what happened to me. But if I did, it would be for that reason, that going to school um, seems to provide the opportunity to just do that all day, yeah. every day with a bunch of other people who are just doing that. And that alone seems like a blast. It, it's an interesting one because... You know, people can have very different experiences. It, it, it depends on what your, you know, your personality type is, if you believe in such things. You know, I know people, my, my business partner, for example, who would be totally happy to, you know, for me, because he tells this story himself um, all the time. He was broken by jazz college. He went in as a very uh, enthusiastic, very talent, you know, talented, very technical, um, very highly intellectual musician and came out the other end never wanting to look at a guitar again in his life and it I think the reason that he found it difficult is because like a lot of artistic pursuits and particularly um artistic pursuits where the level it's, it's real meritocracy jazz you know you're either good at it or, or you you know you when you go into college you go in there and there's some people who are already great at it and you can go in there as somebody who really can't do it. And if you don't have a competitive streak, you don't engage in that environment well, it's a real, it, you can suffer a lot mentally from it. Um, because it's not like anybody is, it's not, a, I'm not suggesting for a second that anybody's bullying anybody else or there's a real negative environment. But if you go into something like that and you see a bunch of people can already do the thing that you want to be able to do, and they're already talking the language and they're already engaging and you're struggling but also, you're on a one thing that if you've got very good teachers, then it can be a real rewarding experience. But the average music college, you know, they're seeing so many students every single week. And it's very difficult for the teachers to tailor your learning specifically for you. They've got to get you through a syllabus, they've got to get you through a curriculum. And it's a little bit like a factory line, production line of, of musicians. And that's not a good learning environment for a lot of people. So what I'm saying is that if you are somebody, like in my case, I went in and I had incredible, like crazy amounts of technique, but I couldn't really play over changes and I didn't know the fretboard well. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you had guys going in there who could basically already play jazz. And so they went straight in there and they were gigging straight away and they were playing in trios and quartets and they could sight read and they could read chord charts and they understood what they were doing. They were there to hone their task. I went in fairly naive, not really understanding what I'd ha you know, what was laid out in front of me. However, I totally and thoroughly embraced the mindset and the competitive nature of it. And I was, I was very, very, um, because of that level of addiction and then my obsession with harmony and my obsession with wanting to be better at this thing and being very into it. Although I would say categorically, my teaching was generally, the teaching that I received was generally very poor. Um, that I went to the library every day and I took books out. I studied, I studied and studied and I listened and I listened to you know, myself a lot. Very self-directed learning. And the great thing is that you've got that resource not only have you got the time, you've got the resource of all these other people, you've got all the books in the library. Back in those days, the internet did exist, but you couldn't go online and watch a bunch of YouTube tutorials or buy tutorials from your favourite artist. You had to pull books out of the library. You were pulling records out of the library and listening to them and transcribing stuff and, you know, digesting all of this material. And if that was how you were, you could thrive in that environment. But if you went there expecting that you would be given, actually quite rightly, you would think that you would be given all the information from A through to Z, in the correct order, that you could go from being not a jazz musician to a jazz musician, in the same way that you would hope that if you're doing a medical degree, you would go in not being able to be a medic and come out the other end, hopefully, if you studied, being able to be a medic, and there is a process that takes you through that. That is not how music works. 
It's not the same thing. It can't be broken down apart from the very literal, you know, like we were talking about before, combine this triad with this bass note, you get Z. Combine, you know, this scale fits over this chord. But you can't teach in that context, in, a, in, a, in an academic context, I don't think, unless you're the right kind of person, that you will come out the other end on a production line and just be a good jazz musician or a good fusion player or a good anything. You know, it just doesn't work that way, unfortunately, I don't think. Yeah, it makes total sense. So, so then think now teaching yourself in a teaching position, which you've been many times. Of course, you, you have courses available for people online, guitar courses you do. I assume you've had actual in-person students throughout your life yeah. and you do clinics uh, around the world for various things. So what is teaching to you? Why do you teach? Because maybe this is a little bit of a cliche, but there is nothing quite like the experience of the penny dropping for somebody. And suddenly the smile comes on their face and they understand okay, now I can access that thing that I've wanted to access because they have the same sense of wonder and experience, sorry, they experience that uniqueness of music that, that you and I talked about at the beginning of this conversation, but they don't have access to it themselves yet. I didn't have access to it when I first started playing. If you can give them some kind of access to that and they can understand how to, to do the thing that they've been desperate to do, that is an amazing experience. And also... I just love talking about music. I love, whilst I now am thinking, oh, I want to go and explore the things we've been talking about, that process of the literal understanding of music in terms of the building blocks of why, you know, if you, if you, this fits with this and, you know, if you do X, you'll get, you'll get Y, so on and so forth. Those things I really enjoy teaching as well. Um, and again, just, just talking about music, just, you know, having a conversation with people about music. If it's the thing that you do in your life, you want to talk to people about it. And if you've got a willing victim or participant, depending on where you are with it, uh, it's a, an amazing experience to sit down and teach people. And I enjoy it just as much whether it's a single person in front of me or it's 250 people in a room, you know. Uh, it's amazing to divulge information which enhances someone's ability to either understand or create music themselves. And it's why I'm addicted to what you do, because everything that you're doing is, I'm learning something all the time watching you doing your live streams. And learning is like, what else is there in life apart from learning how to do something better or how to, you know, assimilating information that makes your life better, basically, you know, uh, is a wonderful thing. So if you can be the person who's giving that information to somebody else, it's an amazing experience. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's exactly how it is for me too. And I'll add perhaps that depending on the situation, there's also the potential for a more long-term human-to-human connection that is also very rewarding, let's say. You know, there is there is the experience of giving them knowledge and of them having a haz, and there's experience of getting to know somebody and they get to know you. And as you get to know them better, you can divulge information even better you know if, if you're a perceptive sensitive teacher you have that capacity right that's what defines what a good teacher is versus another is the ability to customize the information that is given to the student and that's one of the troubles with with the sort of online world is how do you foster that how do you create that one-to-one -one connection mm -hmm. um through means like this or through streaming, you know, there's lots of potential barriers and, and lots of enablers that technology has brought about as well in order to do it. But I do find sometimes some difficulty in walking that line between wanting to to reach the most amount of people because like you, I love to talk about the thing that I love to talk about. And the more people that I can share that with, the better. Because when people, I just think about how I was when I was younger, I was, and I mean, I still am, absolutely voracious, so hungry, give me, give me, give me, somebody tell me, how does this work, you know? Wanna yep. make those sounds. And and if this was existing at that time, I would have just ate that up, you know, on streams all day, checking it out, trying to buy courses, all this kind of thing. And so doing that is great, but I also wanna walk that line of how do I have that real connection, that personal knowing someone over time, seeing them improve, giving them, you know, like this kind of thing. 
Because I had that for me too with my teachers. I mean, I I don't do uh, one-on-one online teaching. I used to do a lot of it. I just don't do it anymore. Yeah. Obviously, I do. You mentioned it earlier. I do sell very curated courses on my website that I've spent a long time putting together. In fact, I, I need to do some more actually because I've had, I mean, some of those courses are nine, 10 years old now and I've had very you know different thoughts on how things work up to this point. But they're very different because I've sat down for many, many hours curating that information and figuring out a pathway that hopefully if somebody sat down and studied it on their own, they could get a lot out of it. And the feedback has been that yes, people have got a lot out of it. I find online one-on-one lessons very, very difficult. I find them very frustrating. Whether I've been taking the lesson, which I have done a few times, or if I'm giving the lessons. And there have been in the past a few students that I've taught for quite a, you know, a number of years online. And it's never been the same experience, obviously, as teaching someone in person. And I, I got to a point with it where I just found it very, very frustrating. And I just thought, I don't really, unless, unless I have to do this because I can't afford to pay my bills, I just don't really want to do this anymore. Again, like, like I was saying, even in a room, so I would prefer to do an in-person clinic with 250 people in a room where it's almost not that person, personable. You know, you're, you're speaking to a group of people. You can't address an individual for very long. I would rather do that. That to me is a more rewarding experience for the, the audience in that case or the participants than doing a one-on-one lesson online where we're not in the same room together. And there's all the barriers that that tech, even now with Zoom the way it is and so on and so forth, I still would rather teach a bunch of people in a room in person and have even just like the the sonic experience of being you know sat in front of somebody, the amp is on on stage or on a one-on-one basis, the amps are in the set, you know, in the same rooms each other. You're feeling the sound. The sound is, you know, it, it's it's a more visceral experience than being thousands of miles away from each other and just it's just not the same thing maybe i'm a bit old school in that regard because people seem to i think that's the way it makes total sense to me i've had vast experiences with with both and i totally understand especially uh when it's teaching guitar um or i'm sure for anyone teaching acoustic an, an acoustic instrument there's something very important about that you know it can be done of course online but I feel like online does lend itself a bit better to what I'm doing these days more because it's already yeah. digital. However, it has its own challenges. I want to say the best use of online time is for people who are not beginners, people who are at least intermediate, if not advanced, where what needs to be taught or talked about can be just talked about. It's more on yes, the level absolutely. of understanding about intellectual concepts and all this kind of thing rather than actual demonstrating and showing and listening, because that side is a bitch when it comes to doing the online thing, having to like hear someone play and then their like thing cuts out because it's trying to block the noise and then you're, you're talking, you know, it's just really doesn't work. But for conversation, which can be a, a huge part of learning and teaching music once you get past a certain point, even for instrumentalists, that can become a huge part. Uh, I think it, it works decently well, but in other cases, that makes total sense what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, the, the, again, the courses that I put together, you know, it's all multi-camera stuff, different angles, close-up shots when required, PDF files where you're literally, you know, describing things in great detail, transcribed examples exactly where they need to be. In the online, you know, what used to be Skype lessons, but now I guess is Zoom lessons, they are such a compromise to me that I just got to the point where, I mean, even to the point where, you know, someone would email me and say, can I have a lesson? And I'd say, okay, um, you know, wh- what, what do you want to talk about? And I'd get this perfectly worded email back about the specifics of what they wanted to talk about. They would appear on the camera on the other side of the, you know, the internet and they couldn't speak English. <laughs> and you just think, you know, this is this is such a compromise. This is, this is never going to be the same. And for me to teach effectively, I have to enjoy the process. There's no way that I can teach well unless I'm having a, like I said before, the reason you teach is for some, you know, or one of the reasons you teach is that fantastic engagement of, of helping somebody else to understand something and then realizing that the penny has dropped for them 
and that they now have that ability to converse in that particular element of music. For me, I just find that very hard to be that enthusiastic and to, to, to deliver things in a a really coherent kind of, in, you know, infuse a concept to somebody when, you know, it's fine with a conversation like this, but I would find it very hard to talk to you really enthusiastically and demonstrate something to you over the internet. If we're in the same room as each other and we both had guitars in our hands, it would be such a fantastic experience as compared to if I've got to hold my guitar up here and kind of show you something and it's a, just a, a massive compromise. So yeah, for, I know a lot of people are very successful at it and people enjoy it. And you can obviously have lessons with anybody anywhere in the world now. You know, if you want a lesson with Frank Gambale, go for it. But yeah, for me, it's not something I offer anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Or totally fortunately, un- depending on yeah. how you look at it. Totally understand. Now, I, I want to touch on a point here, which is over the years... I feel like I've come to understand something about myself and my relationship to teaching, which is that I actually learn through teaching. And yeah. the the way that I have to, I don't know, I have some kind of obsession with doing this, with taking in information and then restructuring it and spitting it back out and getting a reflection back from someone. That's a very important thing to me in my own development. So I end up, you know, teaching the things that, that are of interest to me, or I want to teach the things that are of interest to me, as a way of cementing that knowledge of saying, like, if I phrase this this way, do you understand that? And if they do, it somehow clicks for me more, too, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the interesting thing about teaching for me, unless you are teaching a method that you've been taught, so if you if somebody is Again, if you let's say you go, you have lessons with somebody about improvisation or harmony or whatever, and they teach you a very specific method, and that clicks with you, and you then propagate that method outwards, you know, to to other musicians. That that's a very specific thing. But a lot of people, when they teach, they're combining a bunch of things that they've done themselves. So this kind of autodidactic learning that you you know you were talking about, you're pulling a bunch of resources together that you've are unique to you. But while you're doing that. In my case, and a lot of people I've talked to, you're not necessarily thinking about it in terms of how you would divulge that information later on if someone's to ask you the question as to what are you doing. So there's a lot of kind of um, when, what, say for instance, you know, when I when I do masterclasses or clinics, I often talk about visualizing the fretboard and legato, because people often ask me about legato technique and they often ask me about visualizing the fretboard, the tuning, so on and so forth, how to play over chord changes. And when people first started asking me, say, about the legato side of things, because I was so heavily involved in the process of developing that style, I wasn't thinking necessarily very coherently about what I was doing. I was kind of a, I was riding that journey at the time. And I was so addicted to doing it that I was kind of not really experiencing the process in a kind of -of out-of-body experience way where I was taking notes about what was happening. I was just involved in the experience, riding along with it. So then when it came time to teach that stuff, you have to kind of think almost in a different way about how can I break this thing down? It might not actually be what you did. You might not teach it the way you did it. You might, you you try to find a kind of, what's the most efficient way that I can now think back on this process and develop a method that I could teach the thing that I do. Um, I'm I'm forgetting the word for um, this process. I can't, my brain's died. It's quite late for me now, but so my brain's died. But yeah, you, you're, you're thinking back on the process and kind of trying to figure out um, post doing it, what you did and how you did it. So it's not necessarily the case that all these things are just lined up and you can say, well, I did X, then I did Y, and then I did Z and you know, so on and so forth. You have to kind of create this, this process. And the more you teach, the better you get at refining the process of of breaking down the concepts that you are already familiar with in ways that the student can understand. And as I say, this is why I really should go back and shoot, reshoot all those legato videos and the visualizing the fretboard videos because the process has been honed now from teaching it thousands and thousands of times um, and you know other people's input, so on and so forth. And the, the kind of, by proxy of doing that, you, develop, you, you understand the process more yourself. So the act of teaching makes you better at the act of actually doing the thing that you're teaching. And it's a really interesting process, um, you know, and you don't really understand that until you've started teaching people. And especially if you have to teach beginners, because it's 
trying to explain to people basic harmony can often be quite tricky actually if they've got no 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 basis of compa- you know they don't have a starting point um, it's very easy to get things in the wrong order or to think actually do i really understand you know why we use the circle of fifth i mean obviously you do but you don't think about the circle of fifths anymore you don't think about how to teach it i don't teach beginners so if i had to teach the circle of fifths to somebody now i'd have to really think about okay what's a good way of approaching this information and giving this information to somebody in such a way that they could understand it easily and make use of it, you know. Uh, it's it's a huge skill, teaching. Yeah. It's not, you know. I think a lot of musicians, they, you come out of, again, in mu- music school, you, you finish the course and then you think, right, what am I going to do now? Well, the most obvious thing is to teach. But that results in a lot of bad teaching because teaching is not something that's actually that easy to do. It takes a lot of thought and uh, experimentation and you know a lot of skill to do that well yeah and you you hit the nail on the head there about the um, let's say retroactively discerning yeah. how you do a thing and because the thing that you're doing whatever it happens to be that once a thing is doable for you it's no longer a piecemeal process it's 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 a single experience that you go through right it's it's the feeling of i am doing this now not i'm doing all these steps i'm i'm just exactly. doing the thing and the the process of having to deconstruct what is a unified experience into these things with the hope that the student will be able to take these and reconstruct a unified experience for them. That is the trick of teaching. And it's not just about, you know, reciting some information or getting someone to do an exercise. You know, it's about understanding how the experience feels and getting them to be able to feel that experience in some way that makes sense to them. And if that doesn't happen, if they cannot integrate the steps, they can never actually learn the thing. And it will always become, just like you say about improvising, it will become too slow to be useful. And that's frustrating. When you sit down to do whatever, play or compose or do anything, even mixing music, and if you have to put it into steps like this, you're just like, ah, this is it's too slow. I don't like this anymore. I got to go do something else, right? Where when it's unified, it's just woo, woo, this flowing through the thing, right? I mean, that's why... All of us can recall hugely inspirational teachers in our lives, and they are people who totally change your life. You know, they change the direction of your your learning and your life in such profound ways. Because people who can continually inspire you to go along these journeys are difficult. There's a lot to learn. If you're going to be a musician or a producer or do anything at a high level, there is an extraordinary amount of information that you've got to learn keep hold of and utilize in an artistic way. It's no good just to know the information. You've got to actually be able to utilize it in artistic ways and structure it in ways that make sense to other people. And any teacher who can actually take you along that journey in such a way that you remain inspired, but also, you know, the information makes sense. Well, that's an incredible skill. You know, they're the greatest human beings I can think of. You know, the people who, really I feel the warmest about in my life are people who've taught me well and you know the amount of gratitude I feel to those people is just remarkable so the idea of of if anybody was to think that about me that would be incredible you know it's such an amazing thing to be able to give to somebody to to inspire them and to be able to take them some of the way through that journey of being able to do the thing that they dream about being able to do you know what an honor to be able to do that for somebody. It's incredible, really, you know? Yeah. And I suppose actually that is, you know, me being slightly down on, I'm not down on online learning per se, but the the one-to-one side of things I've had bad experiences with. How amazing that, you know, you can do your live streams and there's this, this amazing community of people who are hugely inspired by what you do, you know? That's that's such an amazing privilege, and also it's it speaks volumes about you and about your skill and about the way you communicate. And you're a really good example of this. You know, I've said this to you before. There's no snake oil. There's no selling of something. There's no BS. It's just here's a person who is totally dedicated to the cause, but is also extremely good at at passing that information on in a way that's both inspiring and coherent, and doesn't make it seem daunting. You know, it seems, I think one of the key things about about teaching is you have to make it feel like it's possible. You know, 
It has to always feel possible, but you, you know, you have to put across that this is difficult, it requires work, but it is possible. And I can inspire you to do this, you know, and you, you, you certainly achieve those things really well with the live streams. Mm. So it's, you know, congratulations on that. It's, <laughs> it's fantastic to see. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And this is uh, touching on something that I also wanted to ask you about because, um, you know, I've been on doing the YouTube thing for however many years now, two or three or something like that. You've been doing the YouTube thing for a long time, <laughs> since the beginning, right? Yeah. Was, was it year one of YouTube that you were 2007, on? 2007. So year yeah. two. Year, year two. two. Yeah. yeah. That's a trip. So, okay. My, there's a, so much that can be talked about there, but one thing I wanted to bring up with you is this notion of some, some combination of self-image, fame, if you want to put it that way, notoriety anyway. Uh, let's include in there imposter syndrome and self-doubt. If this is a, a, a thing that I'd be curious to hear you talk about, it's... You know, I have my own thoughts on it too about the experience so far, but for having been there so long and having not only with YouTube, of course, but you get to travel the world, you've got your own guitar, you've achieved many things in your life, you know, that were probably goals for you early on, not to mention your actual playing ability, which is ridiculous, right? So many things that you've wanted to do, people you've met, you know, so much has happened. So thinking from this perspective, you know, what, I just want to leave the floor open for you on that one. What do you, what do you feel about that? Um... Yeah, so it's the only way I can describe it, and I guess this is kind of obvious, it's like a sine wave. There are moments of incredible elation followed by, not immediately, you know, the sine wave, the, you know, the, the, the positive part of the sine wave can last a long time. And for me, I'm very lucky, the negative parts of the sine wave, uh, they never last that long, but they can be quite intense. And what I mean by that is, There'll be moments in my life where I've achieved things that I literally only dreamed about when I was 15, 16. You know, if you'd have said to me, you'd have your own Ibanez signature guitar, you could count John Petrucci amongst your fans, you know. Um, there's all sorts of different things like that that have happened that have just blown my mind completely. But then equally, there are times when, like I was saying before, you're never happy with your playing. You're never happy with what you've achieved. Not in a really negative way, but you wish you could do more. And the more you achieve, the harder it is to deal with the imposter syndrome. It's almost an inevitability. And you speak to anybody, you know, you, you pro I'm sure you, you probably have the same thing from time to time. You speak to anybody who's achieved things in their life they never thought they would achieve. Inevitably, you start to wonder whether those things are actually just chance I mean everything's luck all the way down basically you know it's all luck but um, you start to wonder whether those things you know are deserved or whether it was just chance or whether did somebody make a mistake somewhere along the way is it all going to come crashing down any any day now uh, and you've just got to try not to think about those things too much um, there's a really good I was listening to it today actually um, there's an author Jonathan Haidt I don't know if you know Jonathan Haidt the, the book I was actually reading is, is irrelevant, um, but the, the principle within the book is this idea of your brain having, uh, it's like the concept of an elephant and a rider. So the elephant is just this kind of loose cannon that's constantly just working purely on subconscious instinct. And as the rider, you're the rider, your, your sense of self is the rider and you're constantly trying to control the elephant. But in reality, the elephant's in control you're not really in control. And um, it's actually related to cognitive behavioral therapy, so CBT, where they try and teach you to train the elephant somewhat within your mindset. So the, the, the way this, this kind of relates back to music is that it's very easy to listen to the inner monologue that you have in your mind that's constantly telling you that, well, this must have all been just a, a, a lucky accident and it's all going to come crashing down any day soon. Or your playing's nowhere near as good as you think it is, or that, you know, other people have got the wrong impression and that if they actually heard you play live, they'd think that you were actually terrible. Um, you know, all of these things that musicians go through. And basically that's the elephant being in control. It's just, and you're just along for the ride basically. And you have to try 
to suppress or, well, not even suppress. You have to accept those thoughts and just go, okay, well, that's natural to think those things and just ignore them, just let them go. So you think them for a second and just let them go. And I've got a little bit better at that as I've got older. Um, because one of the things you find as you get older is I was lucky enough to experience the thing of being like the, the new thing that everybody was interested in. There was a period where a lot of guitar players were like, uh, I want to learn your legato thing and you're the guy for legato. I want to learn your particular way of visualizing the fretboard or your particular approach to improvisation. Um, and all of the companies are interested. Everybody wants you to do things with them. Everybody wants you to fly all over the world and do things. And there is an absolute inevitability, as they say, like death and taxes are the two inevitabilities <laughs> of life. Well, another inevitability is that you cannot remain at the top of your career for your entire life. Or you, very few people do. Jeff Beck recently died, remained at the top of his career for the entirety of his life, you know, uh, or the top of his field, I should say, for his entire career. Most people, there comes a peak and then that downward trail starts to happen and is a totally natural period in everybody's life, you know. And a lot of people find that very, very, very difficult to deal with. And I think I may be approaching that threshold where <laughs> things start to inevitably, because you're no longer the young kind of like thing that everybody's interested in. I mean, I, I always, my, my uncle was an Olympic athlete. He was in the Olympics and Commonwealth Games and various other things as a high jumper. And I always think it's a very brutal thing for athletes where you train and train and train and your career is basically at, at best 10 years long. Yeah. And then this thing that you've worked your entire life for up to that point, that's the only thing that you ever did and you sacrificed everything for it is just done because of the, the biology, you know, because of the nature of your body. Um, and artists' careers can do the same thing, but for very different reasons. You know, you you see so many people that crash and burn after their they have an amazing career, and then suddenly it all comes crashing down, and they go through all this horrible period in their life. I think learning to deal with that and going through that in your life and trying to deal with it the best way you can is a really important thing to try and develop in your being, if you like. I don't know how to deal with it. I'm not quite there yet, but I know it's inevitable at some point. And that is going to be an interesting time for sure. Really, really interesting, you know. Yeah, no, so, I, I totally hear you on that. And and, and the athlete uh, perspective obviously makes the most sense. Everybody can see that. But probably it's it's that way even in, in people who are not doing art or, or uh, sports or anything like that. There's just the ebbs and flows of things are working out, things are not working out, which is funny because, you know, in the end... Who's to say, is it really working out right now or is it not? You know, are you sure that it's working out right now? Is, you know what I mean? Like that's the second guessing that can happen uh, or perhaps doesn't happen for certain people where you're so certain in a, in a particular way of interpreting or, or, or thinking about your life, right? Thinking about your life. I am this way and such and such. And certain experiences start coming in that make you think differently. And there's the pain, right? You have a pain between your imagined sense of self and a new, also imagined sense of self that now you believe this one must be true and, and so on, right? It's uh, very painful yeah. for everybody. There's an, there's an interesting thing that um, success gives you you know, whatever the element of success that you've had, you have a, you have a kind of a thing in your life that you've achieved. And then you get a slightly warped sense of, of what success is because the next thing that you do has to be one step above the thing that you did before. Because obviously we're told and we're, we're kind of led to believe that it's always forward motion that you need. You can't go down whatever you perceive as being down. You constantly have to go up. So if you achieve things in your life that you could only dream of when you were younger, you get a slightly warped perspective of, well, what do I do now? You know, how do I, I've got to do something bigger and better than that. And that's not healthy either, because that's not how life works. As I say, life is a sine wave. It, it goes up and it goes down and that's natural. But it's very easy to convince yourself that life should be a linear direction of constant <laughs> upward motion. It's very dangerous to get into that mindset. And I find myself there a few times where I've done... You know, like the last last summer, for example, just to give you one example, I spent a week with Frank Gambali and Andy Timmons teaching in Italy. So you're hanging out with guys that you were your heroes when you were a kid. And as far as the the audience are concerned that you're there to, to play for and their students, so you're teaching them as well, 
you're on the same level as those guys. They're there to see you play. Well, then, when you come away from that on this incredible high, you have to be very careful that you then don't go, right, well, I've got to do something that tops that next because I've done that thing now and everybody's expecting me to do something either at that level or higher next time. And it's a very dangerous way to think because as soon as you inevitably cannot keep that level up all the time, you can start to uh, you know, blame yourself or you can start to doubt yourself and so on and so forth. And again, it's just not how life works. It doesn't matter what career you pick, it isn't always forward motion. Things go up and things go down and that's just the, nat the natural ebb and flow of life, basically. And I'm not, me saying that is giving myself advice. I'm not always good at this. The last six months for me have been very difficult from a guitar perspective. I, I think I mentioned it to you. I found it very difficult to pick up the guitar over the last six months for various reasons I won't go into now. But um, it's just natural. I mean, I, I watched a video, a YouTube video, that a, an amazing guitar player, a guy called Ben Yunson, oh, yeah. incredible guitar player did few months ago where he was saying in 2019, he had a fairly lengthy period where he just didn't want to pick up a guitar. He was basically burnt out, you know, the idea of, I think he'd achieved a lot in his playing. I mean, it's not always career based. You can achieve a lot in your playing and have a huge amount of growth, forward motion, and then suddenly hit a brick wall. And you have to deal with that as well. You have to learn how to deal with that. Growth is not always, whether it's career based or whether it's just, you know, musical, personal musical growth. It's not always forwards. Um, and it's just one of those things that you have to learn to accept. Human beings don't work that way, unfortunately. Yeah. Fortunately or unfortunately, like, hard to say, right? Yeah, unfortunately well, this is it. Yeah, for our mind, exactly. yeah. But fortunately for nature, things don't go that way. It seems, yeah. to, it seems to thrive off of its own decaying. Kind of well, that's it. It's the, well, yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, that, that is how nature works. But human beings have that, it's almost the curse of consciousness that you have that inner monologue that you cannot switch off and it's always there. <laughs> and learning how to deal with that inner monologue and when to listen to it and when to just say, you can never switch it off, but you can accept the thing that it says and then just let it go. And I think that's a really important skill to try and develop and it's something I try to develop. I know people practice mindfulness, meditation for these kind of things and be very successful at it. I've never really done that in any meaningful way. But I, as I've got older, I have got better at kind of just accepting, you know, okay, I feel this way today. That's the way this day is going to be. I'm not going to force myself to pick up the guitar. I'm not going to make myself feel worse by picking up the guitar. I'm not going to linger on these thoughts of, okay, I haven't done anything for six weeks. My career must be over. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to linger on those things. Or, or you know, silly things like, I don't feel like making an Instagram video today. I don't feel, I just feel like playing a video game or consuming YouTube for the day. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's the way it goes. You just got to accept those things and, you know, I think that's how people can make themselves very ill indeed by constantly trying to have forward motion all the time and then becoming obsessed with the fact that it's not going the way they want it to be and then blaming themselves for it, you know. It's so, incredible how instructive actually are our instinctive sense of what we want and feel to do. Uh, that is not, I don't mean the mental story, I mean the instinctive sense that just arises in you, I just want to play video games today. I don't want to do this for weeks now. Like, there's a, there's a kind of wisdom there that can easily be overshadowed by this mind that is, that is actually, the mental story is fully, fully conditioned by centuries of human development and that has been brought down to you through blah, 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 blah. And the, the issue is that when that's arising in your own mind, that feels true to you. That feels like, yep. oh, these are, my, these are my thoughts. These are my ideas. These are, you know, of course I, I'm supposed to be doing this, you know, except your instinctive sense is so clearly telling you, no, don't do that. That's not working right now. You don't need to do that. And this is one of the things I, I'm looking at my dog right now. Funny enough, to anybody who's listening, our dogs have the same name, which is the most bizarre coincidence. Well, it's not like it's a normal dog name either. It's no, quite an unusual dog name. <laughs> Sprout is the name of the dog. He is a dog Sprout. We have a dog Sprout. It's just very bizarre. Yeah, bizarre anyway, yeah. um, the, living with animals, I think, is extremely instructive in this way. To see the way that animals conduct themselves without any forethought or afterthought. Was I... 
Was I a good girl today? How am I going to, you know, are we going to get back to that beach? Did, did he think that about me? No, it's just like, bang, just there. If she's feeling that way today, she's feeling that way today. And then when there's nothing left to look at in the room, sleep. Yep. Wake up. If there's something to do, we're doing it. There's nothing left, sleep. No resistance to the natural flow of her functioning. You know, that's wonderful to see. It's interesting though. I mean, uh, this this is a conversation that go on for hours, but um, <laughs> the, the the emotional awareness of dogs is just remarkable to me. I mean, as much as you know, they they do seem to just go through life on a whim and a, abandon. Uh, my sprout in particular is incredibly emotionally aware, and she seems to be able to predict emotionally. She thinks about what's going to happen. She seems to be able to predict scenarios and gets worried about things that might happen mm -hmm. before they've even happened, or even if they're not going to happen. Um, it's remarkable the synergy between. This is nothing to do with music, it, you know. Except maybe it is uh, the synergy yeah. between humans and, and and dogs is just remarkable to me. Absolutely yeah. amazing. It's but that amazing. is a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that I know. Because I was yeah. thinking there's another conversation. With, you know, I was thinking about what you were talking about in terms of. Uh, having a, a conversation about free will and all sorts of things, but that's that's for another day, maybe because that's, that's another a day. Massive conversation. I'm ready for it. You, see, yeah, you yeah. pick the time. I have one last question for you, um, because a lot of people, I think, especially in my community here, and probably anybody who's watching this, if it's not already the case for them, are at least somewhat curious about a life in music, living off music. And is that the way to go? Is it what it's cracked up to be? Is it better than the alternative? Blah, blah, blah. And of course, both of us have, I mean, I kind of know for you for sure. I assume I've never done anything in my life except musical other than I worked at a video store for one year and I worked at a, uh, at a movie theater for one day. And on that day, at the end of the day, they had me pick up a pile of puke from the sink and transport it over to the garbage. And as I was doing this, I was like, what? <laughs> and I had already been teaching music for years at that point. And I was like, what am I doing? I'm going to go back to teaching music. And that was That is it. incredibly funny because I, I worked in a uh, blockbuster video store mm. for, um, oh, six months. And I also worked at Virgin Megastore as a, in a record store, which was great. That was an amazing job. You know, this is when I was, just after I graduated, but I also worked as a recruitment consultant for one day. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and immediately, within five seconds, knew that this was not something <laughs> I wanted anything to do with at all and quit the same day. So very similar to you, my life has exclusively revolved around earning money, apart from those very brief periods in music. So that's actually a very difficult question to answer because I have no basis for comparison. And actually, when I think, I have, I have two brothers and a sister. So I have an identical twin brother and an older brother and then a, a younger sister. And they all have what you would class as being, although they aren't conventional jobs, if you'll excuse the term, they aren't, they, none of them have conventional jobs. But compared to what we do, that would exist within the trope of being, you know, normal jobs. Um, and I'm terrified by, I, I have no understanding of what they do at all. The idea of going to a nine to five job to me just makes no sense at all. It makes sense. I just, it just, this is bizarre to me. Yeah. So I have no basis for comparison. What I can say is that if you can make a living from music and not be, I, well, let me put it this way. I am not, I don't buy into the idea and I have a few, I know people who do this of being the suffering artist who, who has to eat cold beans from a can and is constantly having their mobile phone cut off, can't afford their bills, but is an artist and is living their truest life. That is no way to exist as far as I'm concerned, and that's just me. I'm not telling anybody else how they should live, but I could not live that way. So what I'm saying is if you can make a living from music and live a reasonably comfortable lifestyle, you don't have to live, you know, it depends on who you are. You don't have to live a particularly materialistic lifestyle. If you have the things that you need, in order to survive, it is a wonderful way to be because you won't find a single person who meets you and says, what do you do? And you tell them what you do, who doesn't say, that's amazing that you can do the thing that you love as your career. You know, it doesn't get better than that as far as having a job goes. 
because it isn't a job. Like when when my I had this conversation with my dad yesterday. We were talking about various things, and you know, the idea of being a working musician came up, and I said, Dad, I, I'd never work a day in my life. I don't have a job. It's not a job because it doesn't feel like a job. Because think about the number of people out there who basically work to exist or exist to work. You know, it doesn't matter which way around you put that equation. Basically, they work and work and work and work so that they can have a couple of days off in the week that they can do that. And that's, you know, I'm not making a judgment there at all. It's not meant in that way. But the privilege of being able to do what we do, which is the thing that we're obsessed with, you know, the amount, think about all the things we talked about tonight in terms of the experience of music, the love of it, the addiction to it. And you get to do that and people pay you to do it. It's crazy. It just doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. You know? So, and as I said earlier, there has never existed a better time in the entirety of, of human civilization to make a living from music. There hasn't ever. This is the best time that musicians have ever had to earn money from their craft. I know the record industry has died a death. I know that traditional touring has died a death, but if you use the tools that are available to you and the resources available to you as a musician these days, you know, the world is your oyster basically because the audience that you can, you are a fantastic example of this. I've done this as well. Your audience has gone from the local people around you, maybe if you can travel a bit to the people within your wider area to the entire world, you know? So, yeah. you know, and you can release apps, you can release tuition material, you can play music on live streams, you can do what you do. There's so many things that you can do these days. So if it's if you're passionate about it and you are good and you think people will be interested in what you do and you love what you do, definitely go for it, for sure. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about it too. And, and people have no idea the amount of niches there are in the musical world. The amount yep. of stuff that you can do that can earn some kind of money and is musical is crazy. I, I had such limited ideas coming into it. You know, oh, I'm going to be a composer. And that's it. That's all I thought, you know. And then all these opportunities opened up to do the weirdest stuff. And I don't, when I'm doing these things, I don't feel like, oh, but I kind of wish I was, you know. I like it all. It's all so interesting and cool because it's all these different facets of this incredible indescribable thing that we love and you get to explore mm -hmm. it and see it from different perspectives and you know i i tell people the same if if you have a the love for it and you can feel in yourself when when you know when you're not being overrun by stories of self-doubt blah 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 there's a sensation in you of potential you can feel your own potential i can only speak for myself but i want to say because i've talked to others about it there's a sensation in you that even though you are not able to you know fully realize your vision let's say at the moment you can feel like i know i can do this if i were to put myself to it i can do it and i can do it well if that's in you you got to do it you know and yep. and following that there's all sorts of these stories and, and concerns oh but won't it uh, drain your love for the thing and won't it well maybe i don't know it depends on the person for uh, sometimes I don't feel like doing any music after I've done music all day. I sit at the computer, you know, I'll play some guitar maybe later or something. But yeah, sure. It, in certain ways, it I can get burnt out on it or whatnot. But would I trade it? No, absolutely not. I think about doing anything else and it's incomprehensible to me. I, <laughs> I, and I, I, I realize that, that I, like you, are in such a ridiculously privileged position to be able to do what we do and to live off it. It's, it's stupid. It's just shocking that it's well, possible. It, I mean, that idea of doing something else is both literally and conceptually ridiculous to me because I don't actually know what else I could do at this point. You know, <laughs> I've spent so much time doing this thing that, I mean, I, I literally can't think of anything I, I either would want to do or could do at this point. You know, mm. I'm locked in now and that's a good thing. You know, I've, I've, it, it, if you're, I mean, anything that you're really passionate about, you will do a good job at. And now, as I say, not only will you do a good job, you can actually monetize it now, you know. Um, so, and it will never feel, it will feel like work in terms of it's, it can be hard work, but it will never feel like work in terms of either you're making money for the man or you are doing something that you don't want to do just so that you can do something else, you know, in the limited amount of time that you've got available to you. It never feels like that, you know. 
again, it doesn't mean it's not hard work. Yeah. It can be incredibly hard work, but it's always rewarding because that you always are doing the thing that you love at the end of it. And it's not like, for me, it's never been like working in an ice cream shop and you love ice cream and then by the end <laughs> of it, you could never want to see an ice cream again in your life. You know, it just, it doesn't work that way. Yes, I, I did describe before that I didn't want to play a guitar for six months, you know. But that doesn't mean I stopped doing anything related to music, you know. I still, still, that was still my job. That was still the thing I was doing. Um, it's just that it, it wasn't necessarily that at that point in my life, I wanted to pick up a guitar and play for eight hours a day, you know. Again, it's an ebb and a flow. And that's the same, it doesn't matter what career you do. My dad was a veterinary surgeon. And by the end of it, he didn't want to be a veterinary surgeon anymore, but that doesn't mean that he didn't love the process getting up to that point, you know. No career is going to be smooth all the way through, as we said before, but, you know, just the idea of being able to do the thing that you love for a living and get paid for it is remarkable, you know. It's yeah. incredible. It's incredible. Well, that's that's all I need to say about it. So thank you so much, Tom, for being with me. It's truly a pleasure. pleasure. I'm so glad that we made this happen finally and that you agreed to be the inaugural guest on the show. So really, thank you so much for all that you have taught me, all that you've said to me, whether you've known Same it or here. not over the years. Really, I, I can't say enough about it. It's, it's a treat, real treat. Well, my pleasure. Again, thank you for all the inspiration over the last sort of, I guess it's nearly two years now. Crazy. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Wild. Okay. So have a good night, and uh, hopefully we'll do another thing together soon in some capacity. Awesome. Thanks, Max. Yeah. Okay. See ya.